Three days later, Thursday, 4.30 p.m., all the classes had ended. Today was the regular meeting of my second club, Foodie Exploration. Aisha glanced at me and left first, evidently not wanting others to see us leaving together. Following her cue, I waited about five minutes before departing. To an outsider, it might resemble a secret romance. I packed my bag while conversing with Nocter. Are you taking care of yourself, Theo? Even if you don't train, make sure to take the elixir regularly. It's most effective if you take it an hour before bed. Yeah, I take them every night before bed. But I haven't noticed any effects yet, and they don't taste good either. When can I expect to see results? Hmm, for someone like you, Theo, you should see effects within a month. Our ancestors who went to the site of the war god proved it themselves. Alright, I'll keep that in mind. Great, stay strong. I'll go ahead. See you tomorrow. With those words, Nocter and the orcs left the classroom. Just as I was about to leave. Hey, you. Peel approached me. What's up? Why haven't you been coming to the training grounds lately? Then, Peel coughed awkwardly, looking embarrassed. I recalled my words to Peel last week, urging her to overcome her struggles and not to mention despair. Considering she's talking to me again, she must have taken it well. I decided not to mention my poor physical condition. I've been busy with club activities lately. Really? What club? Peel widened her eyes in surprise. Foodie exploration. I have a regular meeting today, so I'll be going. With that, I left the classroom. Aisha, who had been peeking from a distance, quickly averted her gaze. Approaching her, I asked. What are you doing? Well, since you were taking so long, I thought something might have happened. Really? Of course. Anyway, what took you so long? Even though I'm the next club president. We're going to be late. Luckily, I booked our reservation a bit late. Aisha seemed unusually flustered. I felt like teasing her, but that would only make her upset. I matched my pace with Aisha and said, there was a reason for it. Anyway, I have a question. What is it? Why do you have foodie exploration meetings on Thursdays? Wouldn't Fridays be better? Of course, all the club members are underage, so they won't be drinking alcohol, but why not Fridays? Wouldn't it be better to enjoy delicious food at the end of the week as a way to wrap things up? Aisha spoke with a serious expression. Absolutely not on Fridays. Everywhere is crowded on Fridays. What's the purpose of the foodie exploration club? To savor good food in excellent restaurants. I don't like eating in noisy environments. I see. Aisha is a character who enjoys a high-end lunch box for lunch and dines at a restaurant for dinner. She could be considered a gourmet, but she's not a true food connoisseur like Amy. Amy enjoys delicious food itself, while Aisha tends to eat more for her self-esteem. But it's a bit strange. I encounter her every day in the noisy cafeteria. Well, Aisha must have changed too. Just like Andrew did. As I nod in agreement, Aisha gazes at me curiously. By the way, what did you talk about with Peel? She asked why I haven't been showing up at the training fields. I see. Anyway, let's hurry. We don't want to miss the carriage. Understood. At the newly opened restaurant behind the magic department, Aisha and I arrived with the foodie exploration club. Including Aisha and me, there were a total of seven people, consisting of two second-year students and five first-year students. However, there was a familiar face. Welcome, Aisha, Theo. It was Andrew. We've been seeing each other quite often lately, Andrew. Are you a member of the foodie exploration club as well? Of course, isn't the joy of eating the true pleasure of life? Andrew leaned back in his chair, smirking. I couldn't help but agree with him. Having a romantic relationship seemed like a luxury to me. Before inhabiting Theo's body, my life's pleasures consisted of playing Karenzina Chronicles and savoring delicious food. That was all. For that reason, I'm genuinely excited now. Since arriving in this world, I've barely had the chance to dine at high-end restaurants, as I've been preoccupied with surviving each day. You're right. Delicious food is something we can't live without in life. Aisha laughed and agreed. Then Theo, before we sit down, let's introduce ourselves. Everyone, our new member is Theo. You all know him, right? The club members subtly nodded their heads, mirroring the serene atmosphere of the restaurant. However, a question crossed my mind. Before that, Andrew, when did you start participating in club activities? It's unusual for someone like Aisha to be in three clubs, as most people are only in one or two. Naturally, overlapping clubs are rare. Moreover, in the original story, Andrew never joined any clubs. Even if the story has changed, it's still peculiar. Aisha answered on his behalf. Andrew joined this week, just like you, Theo. He also joined the Tactical Strategies Club. During the Tactical Strategies Club meeting, Andrew never mentioned that he was a newcomer. He actively participated in discussions, so I assumed he was an existing member. Suddenly, I felt wronged. I had awkwardly introduced myself to kids who were at least a decade younger than me. Andrew, why didn't you introduce yourself during the Tactical Strategies Club meeting? Theo, I did it before you arrived. You were late this time, and the last time too. Andrew replied nonchalantly. It was true, but I didn't like how he casually accepted my introduction as if he were a regular member. I confronted him directly. We should have introduced ourselves together, Andrew. I don't know your hobbies or why you joined this club. 
I know nothing about you, I don't want to, Andrew rejected my proposal outright. I turned my head and looked at Aisha, is this right, Aisha? Uh, um, well, Aisha stuttered after hearing my question, Andrew. How about introducing yourself together with Theo? He and I don't know the details of why you joined this club. Andrew kept his mouth shut. Aisha continued to speak, we're curious about who you are, Andrew. We couldn't hear your introduction properly last Friday, she smiled as she said this. Finally, Andrew reluctantly stood up and introduced himself, fine. My name is Andrew Jackson. My hobbies are magic and tactical strategy research and the reason I joined this club is. After Andrew finished his introduction, I smiled sincerely. You brat, you should have been more courteous. After my introduction, we enjoyed our meal in a friendly atmosphere. Since it was a course meal, it took a long time to eat. When we stepped outside, it was already evening. We said our goodbyes to the club members and headed to the carriage stop. Phew, I felt good after having a satisfying meal for the first time in a while. The dark sky looked beautiful. As I was admiring the view, Aisha spoke to me. Tomorrow is the long-awaited drumroll, please. Fishing club. As a direct descendant, you must know, right? Most heroes who left their mark in history enjoyed fishing. We're meeting after the lecture tomorrow, okay? Understood. Also, also, also. You really sound like a blunt old man. Can't you speak a little more nicely? Anyway, bring a change of clothes tomorrow. You might need a spare set. All right, understood. Fine. After parting ways with Aisha, I boarded the carriage heading for the dormitory. Fishing, ha, huh, I detest fishing. It's because of my uncle. Due to a tragic accident, I lost my parents and had to live with various relatives. Among them, I stayed the longest at my uncle's house. My uncle was obsessed with fishing. It went beyond a hobby, he was a true fisherman. The first thing that comes to mind when I think of him is the pungent smell of seawater. He always had that lingering, unpleasant odor that wouldn't wash away. The only good memory I have of him is when he caught a sea bream and prepared it as sashimi. It's not about catching fish, it's about catching life. Every weekend, without fail, my uncle headed to the sea. What, you think I'm lying? It's true. If you're an experienced fisherman, you can read a fish's mind. Yet, he couldn't read the crumbling heart of his wife. His main focus was sea fishing, which entailed transportation costs, bait expenses, and boat rental fees. It was a significant burden for my uncle, who wasn't well off, but he couldn't give up fishing. Why on earth is this useless man so obsessed with fishing? Instead of wasting time, go out and earn some money. This is all part of social life, you silly woman. How dare you nag at your husband like this? Ugh, I can't take it anymore. What did I do in my past life to deserve a husband like this? Our child isn't even being raised properly, and I have to feed a child not related by blood. As soon as I turned 20, I left that house. I didn't have anywhere else to go. Even after so much time has passed, the sound of my uncle and aunt's arguments still rings clearly in my ears. Phew. My weary sigh echoed hollowly through the empty carriage. Chapter ends. The following day, Friday. Ugh. I sluggishly got out of bed and stretched my body. About 80% of my full condition had returned. Good. After washing up, I stepped out of my room. As always, Amy was waiting for me, standing upright. Here are the shabby clothes you requested, young master. I've prepared them as you asked, but, may I ask where you'll be using them? For club activities. I'll probably return late tonight, so have dinner without me. Understood. I accepted the clothes from Amy and headed to school. However, for shabby clothes, they were far from shabby in terms of material. Perhaps it's like how wealthy people wearing luxurious t-shirts as pajamas? Even when it comes to style, that trait is still in effect. Arriving at the lecture hall, I took my seat beside Nocter. Time flowed as usual. I attended the morning lectures, had lunch with Nocter, and then listened to the afternoon lectures. Commit this topic to memory, as it will appear on the midterm exam. By now, I'd grown accustomed to the professor's lecturing voice. It was so sleepy, almost like a lullaby. These days, the professors no longer suddenly ask questions during lectures, which made it even harder to stay awake. The lack of questions felt a bit awkward. Today, I had fishing club activities. All right, everyone, have a great weekend. See you next week. Starting next week, practical evaluations will begin in earnest, so take care of yourselves. Once all the lectures had ended, the professor left. The students hurriedly packed their bags. Like yesterday, Aisha gave me a glance before exiting the lecture hall first. Boom. Suddenly, I felt something was off. Two weeks ago, on Friday, Aisha followed me when I went to the Eastern Forest to collect my first hidden piece. Aisha is the next club president. Naturally, she would have been active since the first semester. Is it okay for her to miss the regular meeting that happens once a week? Well, I'm sure she figured something out. I brushed off my doubts and left the classroom as well. Step by step, Aisha and I made our way to the front gate of the hero department. Yesterday, there were many people outside, so I kept a five-step distance between us. But today, since it was the last day of the week, there were fewer people around. With her gaze fixed straight ahead, Aisha spoke to me. We'll take the carriage to the reservoir on the west side of the academy. 
There's beginner equipment available there. Oh, and did you bring a change of clothes? Yes. Ah. Yeah, that's right. Just say yes. The other way sounds odd. All right. We maintained a distance of about three steps from each other and arrived at the stop in front of the main gate of the hero department. I saw two familiar faces. Max. And. Are you a member of the fishing club too? Yes, that's right. It was Andrew. It was Andrew. Anyone with half a brain would know by now that Andrew was interested in Aisha, the puppy love of a 16-year-old boy who wanted to make a connection with the girl he liked. It's a scene I've seen a lot in creative works, but was there a setting where Andrew liked Aisha? In the original work, Andrew is a true narcissist with misophobia. There was never a description of him liking anyone, including Aisha, in any route. Sure enough, the story has changed. I silently sent my condolences to Andrew. Aisha is cunning, rational, and smart. She's a girl who knows she's pretty. No matter how much of a magic genius Andrew is called, he's naive in human relationships. In the original work, he was subtly ostracized. Besides, don't people who think they're smart become even dumber when they fall in love? Unrequited love, huh? Hang in there, Andrew. It's so obvious it won't work out that I can't help but feel sympathy. I sincerely cheered for Andrew in my heart. Lately, Andrew's mood was fluctuating wildly. He even suspected that he might have bipolar disorder. The cause was Theo Lynn Waldirk and Aisha Waldirk. Both of them were from the Waldirk family and his classmates. Aisha. Andrew had fallen for Aisha. Of course, Aisha was the idol of the academy. Countless guys loved her gentle smile. Andrew knew that Aisha gave her gentle smile to most people. He vaguely guessed that the smile she gave to him was no different from the one she gave to other guys. However, that didn't matter. The moments when he saw Aisha's gentle smile were incredibly blissful. Holding his fishing rod loosely, Andrew reminisced about last Friday night. At that time, he had been defeated by the damned orc and wanted to die from the feelings of self-loathing and helplessness. But Aisha had smiled at him kindly and said, Would you like to attend a little get-together in my room to unwind after the practical evaluation? I'm not really in the mood right now. Andrew, I've been there too. And I realized one thing. It's much better to be with someone than to suffer alone. You are a precious person. And thanks to her care, he returned to his usual self in less than an hour. From that moment on, he fell for her. It's said that men, at least once in their lives, throw everything away for a love that seems impossible. That statement perfectly fit his heart right now. And Andrew was confident that he could make Aisha's smiling face turn towards him alone. First, I'll start by encountering her more frequently. So he joined three clubs he never thought he'd be a part of. But, he didn't expect Theo to be so annoying. Aisha, who always had a gentle smile, showed various expressions in front of that guy. Instead of jealousy, he was puzzled. What am I lacking compared to that guy? The Waldirk family didn't scare him. Though he was a commoner now, his future self was destined to become an outstanding hero. An outstanding hero boasts a greater status than most nobles. With that in mind, he wouldn't feel ashamed to court her. And though he slipped up last week, he was still the ninth-ranked top student in his grade. As Andrew pondered these thoughts, he glanced at Theo. Why is he so good at this? Theo was effortlessly catching fish one after another. Max, am I doing it right by throwing like this? Yeah, that's right. You don't seem like a beginner at all, Theo. You're really good. You could become a true fishing expert. I'll pass on that. Anyway, I think it's thanks to the teachings of a good mentor. Andrew's face twisted in annoyance. Max. I learned with him today, too. Andrew hadn't caught a single fish. Theo had simply grasped Max's movements using observer's eye, but Andrew had no way of knowing that. A sense of inferiority welled up deep within him. However, Andrew found relief in that emotion. Inferiority is something you feel towards someone of similar caliber. But really, Theo and Max? The combination of the hero department's most notorious troublemaker and the timid guy. They don't match at all. With that thought in mind, Andrew was lowering his fishing rod when. It's here. Suddenly, Max's fishing rod started to shake violently. Even Andrew, who wasn't familiar with fishing, could tell it was extraordinary. Who youp? Max's impressive biceps swelled. He then slowly pulled up the fishing rod. A large fish hanging at the end came into view. It was a moonfish, as long as an average person's arm. Ah, uh, it's really strong. Max exerted his strength to pull up the fishing rod to its limit. Whoosh. The fishing rod bent dramatically, and, ah, Max lost his grip on it. The fishing rod flew towards Andrew and Theo. However, it was Theo on the outer side who would be hit. How unfortunate. Andrew smiled at the impending disaster that would occur in just one second. But, Theo dodged the fishing rod with nimble movements. Ugh. The fishing rod with the fishhook attached to it collided with Andrew's body. In an instant, Andrew's clothes became a mess. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Andrew's mind went blank. His obsession with cleanliness was triggered. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. He wanted to wash his body and change into different clothes immediately. However, Andrew didn't bring any spare clothes. He wanted to only show Aisha his best side, so he didn't pack any shabby clothes. The smell of water and fishiness irritated his nose. How truly, disgusting. He knew it was his fault for not avoiding it. 
But at this moment, he couldn't help but resent Theo. Andrew looked at Theo with undisguised anger. Change into these. Theo handed him a set of clothes. They were quite stylishly designed. I don't need them. No, take them. In a way, it's my fault too. Are you injured? Theo asked nonchalantly. I, I am really sorry, Andrew. I stupidly let go of the fishing rod. Max, who had approached them by now, scratched his head vigorously with a flushed face. Aisha was also looking their way with wide eyes. Andrew lowered his head and admitted his defeat. Theo had shown him mercy despite their constant clashes. He was thoroughly defeated. Yet, Theo appeared nonchalant, as if this was a natural occurrence. My arm hurts. Thank you, Theo. Andrew accepted the new clothes and thought to himself. All right, I admit it, Theo. You are my first true rival in 16 years. Chapter ends. Two days later, on Sunday. Ah, I feel better now. It seemed my body had fully recovered. I could still feel the fatigue from yesterday's training, but I'd consider myself in top condition at this point. And there was a significant gain. My previously desperate tenacity stat had increased to 4. I think yesterday's training, while still suffering from overloads after effects, was the deciding factor. Great. With a tenacity of 4, I'd now reached the edges of being an average person. My strength and stamina remained at 7, but with consistent training and attention to nutrition, they should increase soon. If I continue to collect hidden pieces and acquire at least one more useful trait, I should be able to graduate. However, graduating with outstanding grades seems difficult. I did defeat Ralph, who was ranked 37th, but that was only because my tailored strategy worked perfectly. I was also quite lucky. I must relentlessly hone my skills. Let's head to the training ground right after washing up. The practical evaluations start tomorrow, so I shouldn't overdo it. I thought this while eating the high-protein meal Amy prepared for me. Oh, I should also stop by Professor Mari's office. I kept forgetting because I was so busy. In the original work, Mari was a workaholic who would be in her office by 8 a.m. I should visit her tomorrow morning. There might be some unexpected gains. The hero department's training ground is closed on Sundays. After showering, I immediately headed to the third training ground. First, I'll practice swordsmanship, then physical training. Upon arriving at the third training ground, I promptly opened the door to the swordsmanship training area. Creek. Perhaps because it was Sunday, there was only one person inside the swordsmanship training area. Someone I knew well. Irene, with her long purple hair tied back, was swinging a wooden sword. Whoosh, whoosh. Irene seemed deeply focused, as she didn't pay any attention to the sound of the door opening and continued to swing her wooden sword tirelessly. I took in the sight of her. Boom. As expected, Irene's swordsmanship was excellent. Observer's eye isn't just useful for learning new techniques, it also helps in gaining a deeper understanding of familiar ones. Now, my eyes could clearly see the intricate details that I couldn't discern before. The width of her stance, the snap of her wrist, the movement of her shoulders. The clean trajectory of her sword was visible. Her swordsmanship, like her appearance, was elegant yet devoid of any unnecessary movements, similar to an assassin. As I admired her swordsmanship from a distance. Theo? Irene wiped the sweat off her forehead with the back of her pale hand and looked at me. Irene, who had been swinging her wooden sword, turned her gaze to a familiar presence. There stood Theo, who had been troubling her thoughts lately. Theo? Nice to see you, Irene. However, Theo's demeanor seemed utterly nonchalant. Irene couldn't help but feel irritated. Is that all you have to say? I wanted to see you, Irene. Irene's face turned red. Why is he suddenly being so direct? She had intended to retort, but she forgot what she wanted to say. She thought it was fortunate that her face was already flushed from swinging the sword when she spoke. Fine, I understand. I don't know why you never visited even once. So, have you decided to go back to the way things were? You're not on the carriage either. What's been going on lately? Irene's voice was tinged with thorns. It might be trendy for students to play push and pull games, but this was too much. Shouldn't he at least come to see her after school if he really wanted to make amends? Theo calmly replied, I've been busy. I've been doing something as important as honing my skills. I also took the time to reassess my physical condition. At his confident attitude, Irene found herself at a loss for words. Of course, rest is as important as training, though I wouldn't really know. But what important thing are you talking about? It might be considered a rude question, but Irene couldn't contain her curiosity. Theo nonchalantly answered, I've been participating in club activities. What? Irene was dumbfounded. It wasn't because he referred to club activities as something important. She was well aware of the significance of clubs in the hero department. For heroes, connections are just as important as their abilities. And there's nothing better for building connections than joining clubs. However, that only applies to people who can mingle and get along with others. The Theo that Irene knew was terrible at socializing. He lacked social skills. In front of those superior to him, he would talk behind their backs, while stepping on those inferior to him. It was hard to believe that someone who could be considered an embodiment of the aristocratic strong weak weak strong mentality was engaging in club activities. I thought he had changed, but, to this extent? He had changed, too quickly. A sinister thought began to rise in Irene's mind. 
could it be that he's found another girl? Nina's words came to mind. Men are creatures who can't settle down with just one woman. It's their instincts, so they can't help it. That's why they need to be held tightly to prevent them from even thinking of cheating. How could someone seduce a man who's engaged? Although Irene didn't join a club, she knew what happened in them. After gatherings, people would get together and eat delicious food, occasionally finding someone they like and starting a relationship. All sorts of scandals would occur. Why join a club all of a sudden? Irene looked at Theo with a suspicious expression. To manage my reputation. His response came quickly, but Irene's doubt didn't vanish. Really? Yes. Is it really for reputation management? Yes. The answer came without hesitation. Irene wondered if Theo was pretending. Look me in the eyes and tell me, is it true? Theo silently stared at her. Irene's heart sank. Don't tell me, you really met another wa. It's true. Irene, would I lie to you? At his words, Irene stared intently into Theo's eyes. Deep within his ruby-colored eyes, a burning passion was contained, as if he felt wronged for not gaining the trust of his loved one. Theo spoke. I don't lie to my people. I wish you would believe me. At the same time, a powerful aura could be felt. Theo's eyes, as they stared at her, were fierce. My, my people. Today, his words seemed to hit her harder than usual. Feeling her face blush again, Irene lowered her gaze. She couldn't look him straight in the eyes. It was too embarrassing. Ah, fine. I'll be believe you. But still, Irene hesitated. Clubs are good, but at least visit me once in a while. Her voice trailed off, almost as if it was crawling away. Surprised by her own words, Irene turned her gaze away from Theo, her face flushed. I understand. I've been too careless. Ha, huh? I thought you didn't like me. That's why I thought you rejected my dinner invitation last time. You were so energetic, but suddenly you said you were feeling unwell. Theo was referring to when Irene declined his dinner invitation after a sort practice session last week. She had used her health as an excuse. Irene immediately recalled her feelings at that time. But back then, she had no choice. Feeling too embarrassed and confused, she worried she couldn't control her emotions. She was afraid that a moment of burning passion might lead to more regrets. That, that's. Of course, I know. I'm a good-for-nothing guy, and people don't want to be close to me. But there's no use regretting the past. So, I'm trying to change. I want to become a better man. Theo then slightly lowered his head. I want to become a better man. Theo was a very shy person. Irene knew the words he left unsaid. For you. After her heart had already burned to ashes, she felt it flare up again. Ah, I understand. And it wasn't because I didn't like your dinner invitation that I refused it. Then, why? Theo genuinely asked, looking at her with innocent eyes. He can be so cruel at times like this. Of course, Irene wasn't the type to openly express her true feelings either. Ah, anyway. Since we're at the training ground, we should train. Let's warm up quickly. There were some unsatisfactory moments during the practical evaluation match. Of course, it was impressive, but, understood. With that, Theo immediately began warming up. TCH. She had finally gathered the courage to praise him, but he didn't show any signs of being pleased. Of course, this is better. In the past, he would have been uncontrollably excited by a single compliment. I'm warmed up. Now, grab a practice sword. Okay. Irene watched Theo's back as he walked toward the weapon rack. His back looked like the hero she had dreamt of when she was young. Irene sorted out her fluctuating emotions and admitted it. She still hadn't forgotten him. Chapter ends. Yes, just like that. Raise your arm slightly higher and hold your wrist a bit looser. After the sparring session, Irene spent a long time correcting my overall technique and posture. Indeed, experiencing real combat reveals even the smallest details that were previously unnoticed. In martial arts novels, the protagonist would gain enlightenment after fighting a strong opponent. Was I experiencing the same? Is this how it should be done? Yes, that's the correct posture. When facing an opponent with a larger build than you, just spread your feet a bit wider. Irene was not only skilled but also exceptionally talented at teaching. She explained things at my level of understanding, without using unnecessarily difficult terms. With this level of improvement, I could apply it directly in real combat. Conveniently, there's a one-on-one -on -one sparring session tomorrow. I should put this newfound knowledge to use immediately. Thank you, Irene. You're truly an amazing teacher. I expressed my gratitude wholeheartedly. Irene's face turned slightly red as she spoke. No, Theo, you're the one who's outstanding. You learned so quickly last time too. What happened to you? Did you suddenly awaken some power? It's not an awakening, but I did develop a new trait. Oh, what kind of trait? It's a trait that improves my observation skills. Ever since I got it, it's been easier to read my opponent's movements. I didn't explicitly mention that the trait I gained was observer's eye. I'll keep gaining new traits in the future, so I can't always disclose them. The additional traits I've obtained are magic nullification and observer's eye, two in total. Up to this point, people could understand, but with three or more, anyone would become suspicious of me. They might even say I made a deal with a demon. Also, before receiving a trade appraisal, even the person themselves can't specifically know what it is. 
stats and traits appraisal services aren't all powerful. There are many that deliver inaccurate results. However, Elinea Academy's appraisal service is the most accurate on the continent. It's almost on par with a status screen. Of course, it can only be used once per semester. Well, I can check my status screen anytime. While having these thoughts, Irene nodded and said, it seems like a very useful trait. If your observation skills are good, there are countless ways to apply them, not just in swordsmanship. Anyway, let's wrap up for today. It's better to master what I taught you today and move on to the next lesson. Yes, that seems right. Understood. Ah, and it's not good to keep sparring with the same opponent right now. Your sword will adapt to that person. For now, try sparring with a variety of people. I'll do that, thank you. It's better to skip strength training for now. As Irene said, I should stop here. Starting tomorrow, there's a practical evaluation, so managing my condition would be a better choice. It's already 8 p.m. I arrived at the training field around 4 p.m., so I've been here for about 4 hours. Time flew by. If I eat, wash up, and do other things, it'll be 10 p.m. First, I need to eat dinner. I glanced at Irene. Irene. As our eyes met, her face flushed slightly, and she smiled bashfully. It was a smile I'd never seen before. Yes? Irene, with her smile, looked different somehow. Maybe a smiling face really is the best makeup for girls. I continued speaking. Would you like to have dinner together? Uh, are there any places open now? Maybe the shabby restaurant near the training field is still open. Um, next time, okay? It's not that I don't want to eat with you. Please don't misunderstand. But for our first meal together after entering the academy, I'd prefer a nicer place. All right, I understand. After parting ways with Irene, I had dinner alone at the shabby restaurant nearby. The menu consisted of a soup with meat and vegetables, and a long sandwich filled with vegetables and sausages. I took a spoonful of soup, swallowed it, and then bit into the sandwich. As expected, it couldn't compare to the taste of Amy's cooking. Though they looked similar, there was a significant difference in taste. After finishing my meal, I took the carriage back to the dormitory. Perhaps my repeated pleas for her not to wait for me had worked, as Amy was nowhere to be found. She might be waiting in her room, though. I immediately took a shower and lay down on my bed. In the morning, I had to visit Professor Mari's office. I'd probably have to wake up more than an hour earlier than usual. Not much of this left. I mixed the remaining traditional orc potion into the water, drank it all, and fell asleep. I wonder if Theo made it back safely. After washing up, Irene lay down in bed and tightly clutched her blanket. Of course, I should be happy that he's learning quickly. Yet, there was a lingering feeling of regret. With Theo's ability to learn, he could master all her techniques within this semester. If that happened, one of their connections would disappear. Club activities are for reputation management. Suddenly, Theo's words came to mind. Of course, he wouldn't have lied. However, even if he didn't want it, women would naturally flock to him. A noble with handsome looks and a distinguished lineage. On top of that, his skills were improving day by day, and his personality had become kinder. Naturally, women around him would subtly send him their affections. Of course, he was her fiancé, but the girls in the hero department had a somewhat aggressive side. Regardless of having a fiancé, they might still approach him. Irene had received confessions multiple times herself. She believed that he wouldn't give in, but her anxiety continued to grow. Suddenly, the saying the tree that is struck ten times will eventually fall came to her mind. Ah, I shouldn't. Having finally sorted out her impure thoughts, Irene regretted it. Should I have just eaten dinner with him? Ah, but that was, absolutely not. She had been afraid that he would take it as a sign of rejection, but she didn't want their first meal together after entering Elinea Academy to be at a shabby restaurant. It wasn't because Irene had expensive taste. She usually had simple meals at the student cafeteria. However, she wanted to have their first meal together in a restaurant with an assigned waiter. In a way, it could be considered their first date. Of course, anything would be great if it's with him. Anyway, he said he'd visit the night department sometime next week. For now, Irene convinced herself that this was enough and fell asleep. Dormitory of the first hero department, where only the top 10 students in the grade are allowed to reside. Inside the room of Peel, who was ranked second in her grade. Time had passed, and it was now past 11 o'clock. Usually, Peel would be asleep by now, but she couldn't fall asleep. It was because of the one-on-one -on -one duel scheduled for the next day. Peel was planning to challenge Theo to a duel. During one-on-one -on -one dueling time, students freely paired up and dueled each other. Memories of the first semester came to mind. After the sixth week of the first semester, Peel could not find a dueling opponent other than Neek. This was because, after dueling her once, all the opponents felt overwhelmed and lost their fighting spirit. In the first one-on-one -on -one duel of the semester, Peel defeated more than ten classmates. Of course, there were some classmates who challenged her out of competitive spirit, but after the sixth week, there were no more of those students. They simply felt a sense of awe and paired up with classmates of similar skill. So, Peel had no choice but to duel only with Neek. Unlike back then, Peel didn't blame those who had backed down. It was for knowing their limits and protecting their mental state. She could only hope that, as Theo said, they would accept their defeat. Peel muttered to herself, Will he accept it? She felt like it would be sad if he refused. 
Peel wanted to clearly define her feelings. Ever since she was scolded last Friday, she had been constantly bothered. Initially, she intended to ask him naturally at the training grounds, but he never showed up. He didn't seem to be in pain, so she tried to start a conversation asking why he didn't show up, but he went to club activities. Surprisingly, he joined the foodie exploration club instead of a fighting-related club. I want to compete with that idiot, no, with Theo. She thought that if they had a proper duel, she could feel something special about his convictions. That thought had turned from speculation to certainty. She had never felt anything special from those she had defeated so far. She had only felt the emotion of I can't surpass him from Neek, whom she couldn't defeat. How annoying. It was suffocating to be thinking about him in the middle of the night without sleeping. Of course, she wouldn't be angry if Theo refused the duel. This was, after all, good-natured competitive spirit. Unlike Theo, who also had a noble lineage, Peel didn't have the twisted noble's dignity trait. Let's sleep for now. Whether he accepts or not is up to him. Peel counted her 507th sheep before finally falling asleep. Chapter ends. On the continent of Karenzina, numerous nations exist, including empires, kingdoms, and duchies. In addition, many unexplored regions such as the Great Forest and volcanic areas remain undiscovered. Currently, the main power governing the continent are the heroes. Although they used to be held in check by large noble families in the past, as time went on, the heroes, superhumans with immense strength, gained the upper hand. Now, it is considered natural for high-ranking nobles to send their children to academies to become heroes. Most active heroes are affiliated with a guild. There are over 500 guilds scattered across the continent. As a result, guilds exist not only in large empires and kingdoms but also in small duchies in remote areas. However, the strength of each guild varies greatly. Some weak guilds have only one hero, while large guilds have more than 100 heroes. Among them is Ataraxia, ranked 7th in the overall guild rankings on the continent and 1st in the kingdom of Rodinian. Ataraxia is a unique guild that has developed at a rapid pace among the top 10 guilds. The rapid growth of Ataraxia was achieved by the guildmaster and current ranking 3rd hero, Halo, and his aide, Chief Administrator Haley. There are only 13 heroes in Ataraxia, including Guild Master Hello. Compared to other top guilds with over 100 members, they are a small group. In line with this, Ataraxia's slogan is all for one. They carefully consider the characteristics and preferences of their affiliated heroes, providing them with the optimal aids and thorough care. As a result, numerous heroes want to work for Ataraxia. However, there are only 13 approved positions within the guild. Sunday night. A majestic and mysterious aura emanated from the exterior of the Ataraxia Guild building, located in the capital of the Rodinian Kingdom. Within the kingdom, it was the second largest building after the royal palace. In the middle of it all, Chief Administrator Haley's office light remained on even on a Sunday. Neek is indeed receiving a lot of attention, Haley said as she looked at the report in her hand. Her dedicated secretary replied energetically, Yes, Chief Administrator. Neek is a commoner, but he possesses overwhelming talent, which hasn't been seen since Ryuk, the continent's greatest genius. All the guilds across the continent are showing great interest in him, is it the same for Peel? Yes. Although Peel's talent is slightly inferior to Neek's, she still possesses overwhelming talent compared to other students. Many other guilds are showing great interest in her as well. I see. Haley carefully read the report. The first-year students in Elinia Academy's hero department this year included many with exceptional talent besides Neek and Peel. Haley read the report thoroughly, making sure not to miss anyone. Max, this student is quite peculiar? Yes, they only defended throughout the match, and as a result, they were booed after the game. Since they're ranked 51st in the class, they're not a top priority. However, having such outstanding defensive ability is rare even among active members. Please elevate them to a top priority candidate. Haley's gaze became fixated on one particular spot as she continued to flip through the documents. Theo Lynn Waldirk. This student is ranked 181st but defeated the 37th ranked student? Yes, according to our agent at the scene, Theo completely dominated the match. But he has mediocre stats and no special traits? Well, he's a Waldirk, so he might have acquired a new trait. It seems to be a very special trait. I think so too. The secretary nodded. Haley rested her chin on her hand and lost herself in thought for a moment. Even if he had acquired a master level trait, such rapid growth would be impossible. So what did he do? There's no trace of an artifact either. In her 30 years of examining the profiles of prospective heroes, she had never seen a case like this before. There was a suspicious yet mysterious smell about it. After organizing her thoughts, Haley spoke. What is Theo's current priority status? He is not included in any consideration at the moment. Then please include him as a high priority candidate. After all, he's the most eye catching student in this batch of profiles. Understood. Is there anything else you'd like to assign? No, I'm sorry for making you work on your day off, I like a bad boss. Go home now, even though it's late. It's not a problem. I'll take my leave now, Chief Administrator. The secretary left Haley's office. With a sigh, Haley leaned back in her chair and lit the cigar in her mouth. I'll know when I see it for myself. Whether it's a wyvern or a dragon, Haley closed her tired eyes and took a deep puff from her cigar. The following day, Monday, I woke up an hour earlier than usual. 
my body felt lighter. It seemed that I had fully recovered. Yesterday had brought me another great gain, the additional effect of overload had been unlocked. Now, I could use it for 10 seconds or a minute, however I wanted. Of course, the price I had to pay depended on the duration of use. If I only used it for about 10 seconds, I would probably be able to move around normally the next day. Great. Immediately after arriving at school, I headed to Professor Mari's office. In front of Mari's office, I could sense activity within even though it was early. As expected, she was there. Before knocking, I wondered, what could she possibly need my help with? I didn't know, as I hadn't experienced it in the original work. However, if I deemed it a reasonable investment, I was willing to help. Mari was an ambitious and energetic new professor. Clearing her debt would prove beneficial in the future. Eventually, when I needed help, she might lend me a hand at least once. With that in mind, I knocked on the door of her office. Come in. Mari's voice could be heard from inside. I promptly opened the door and entered. Welcome, Theo. Mari greeted me with a wide smile. A large desk piled with numerous books caught my eye. Mari was dressed not in her usual casual attire, but in battle gear that accentuated her voluptuous figure. Is it because of the practical evaluation? After quickly scanning the room, I bowed my head slightly and greeted her. Nice to see you, professor. I said I would visit, but I got busy and was a bit late. Well, it's fine. I almost grew a beard waiting for you. What kind of tea would you like? Whatever you usually drink, please. All right. Take a seat on the sofa and wait for a moment. Mari stood up and used a magical tool to boil water. The high-priced magical tool, which resembled an induction cooktop, was provided to all professors. Be careful, it's hot. Drink it slowly. Mari placed a teacup in front of me. I picked it up and took a whiff. It was mint tea. I hated it. Maintaining my expression, I opened my mouth. What did you want to discuss? Well, I'll get straight to the point. I'm working on a research project and I need your input, Theo. After hearing your answer during the previous class, I had to change the entire direction of my research. Mari moistened her lips with the mint tea and continued speaking. Though she said she would get straight to the point, Mari's story was quite lengthy. In summary, she wanted me to help her with her ongoing research. She had already reported it and received support funds, so there was no backing out now. This episode wasn't in the original work. As expected, the future had changed. My presence seemed to be having a far greater impact on this world than I had imagined, like the flutter of a butterfly's wings. Anyway, it's something I can help with. It wasn't a difficult task. Moreover, Mari had a personality that always repaid her debts. I should take this opportunity to clear my own debts as well. Pretending to be deep in thought, I crossed my arms and spoke. Of course, I can help you, but what is it? What's in it for me? Tell me what you want, and I'll see what I can do within reason. Of course, I'll also list you as a co-author in the research paper. It'll definitely help your future career as a hero. Mari narrowed her eyes, staring at me intently. She wanted me to reveal my cards first. It would be foolish to demand too much at this point. Actually, I can't think of anything I need right now. Ha! Huh? Mari looked puzzled. I mean, I'll help you without any compensation. Mari's eyes darted back and forth. That was the expression of someone in deep thought. Now was the time to push further. However, next time, if I ever need your help, please don't turn me away. You can leave my name out of it, though. For this research paper, the only name that should appear is Mari Jane. Just one person. Mari rested her chin on her hand, lost in thought. Eventually, she extended her hand to me. All right, Theo Lynn Waldirk. I'll count on you. Of course, Mari Jane. I shook her hand firmly. Chapter ends. During the fifth week, practical lessons were held on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, a total of three days. On Monday, a theory class in the morning helped students adjust after the weekend. However, on Wednesday and Thursday, practical lessons occupied the entire day, from morning until afternoon. The morning theory class passed quickly. At 1 p.m., it was time for one-on-one -on -one duels, the beginning of the official practical evaluations. The one-on-one -on -one duels took place in a vast open space within the hero department, rather than the usual lecture building. Students who had already paired up commenced their duels. I had no predetermined partner. At that moment, Theo, if you don't have an opponent, would you like to have a match? Not to reproached me. No, I want to try facing a new opponent. Good attitude, Theo. A truly outstanding warrior should not fear facing various opponents. I'll find another opponent as well. With that, not to reproached a group of Lizardman students. He provoked the one who seemed to be the leader, and they promptly began dueling. Whom, who should I face? As Irene mentioned, it's beneficial to have a wide range of duels with different people. In all honesty, I could defeat even Andrew, who's ranked ninth, with my magic nullification, so I'll avoid the mages for now. It's best if magic nullification remains a secret. Of course, I'll use it if necessary. I surveyed the area for non-mage students. Familiar faces appeared. Aisha, who continually fired mana arrows at Andrew's barrier, Ishild, who was being defeated by Jang Wuhi again, and Ralph, who was engaged in a power struggle with an orc, were all present. And, why can't you use your strength like this, ha? Huh? Can't you put in more weight? You green pig. 
You're just disgustingly strong. Ha ha ha. A true warrior must be robust and powerful, you two-legged lizard. Noctur was already pushing back the lizard man leader. Their sweaty, two-meter-tall bodies clashed in a fierce battle. Watching them, I felt a surge of adrenaline. I also saw Neek. Ha, but Neek wasn't dueling Peel, he was facing Max. Usually, Neek and Peel are a set. Pababak, pababak dash. Neek's practiced spear repeatedly struck Max's tower shield. Peel was visible in the distance, seemingly without an opponent as she looked around restlessly. Well, who would want to face her? Peel shows no mercy, thoroughly crushing her opponents. In her mind, showing mercy to the weak is deceitful. As I thought this, my eyes met Peel's. HM? Then, she walked towards me. Approaching me, Peel hesitated and then spoke. Hey, let's have a match. Of course, I'm up for it. It's a great opportunity. I no longer have a fragile mentality. I've been enlightened for a while now. And the standard for one-on-one -on -one duels is not victory, but showing a more developed version of oneself. All right. I gripped the practice longsword in my hand. Peel, who seemed surprised, soon grasped a practice rapier. I didn't want to be told to go in first, so I took the initiative. Can I go in first? Of course. Feel free to come in. Peel grinned confidently. I'll wipe that smug look off your face. Recalling the swordsmanship I learned from Irene, I charged at Peel. And within 10 seconds, I was rolling on the ground. Ha! Peel looked down at Theo, who was at least a head taller than her, with a satisfied expression. In a short time, Theo had fallen seven times but kept getting back up. Phew! He got up quickly once more. You really don't give up, huh? It wasn't about treating Theo as a punching bag. Peel simply liked the fire still burning in his eyes. Here I come again. Any time. Theo charged at Peel again. But in less than a minute, he was back on the ground. Arg, ugh. Theo clutched his abdomen where the rapier had struck him while lying down. If it hadn't been a practice weapon, he would have died several times already. But Theo endured the urge to vomit and got back up again. Suddenly, the students stopped their duels and looked at Peel and Theo. Even Professor Mari, who was in charge, watched them with interest. Peel looked at Theo with satisfaction once again. He definitely has extraordinary spirit and perseverance. His combat sense was also exceptional. He kept his guard up against the moves he'd been hit with before and counterattacked. Of course, he's still far from perfect. Peel smirked, feeling a sense of satisfaction. Proposing a match against Theo was an excellent choice. I'm coming again. Theo's eyes stared intently at Peel. There was boiling anger in his red eyes. Of course. Peel replied cheerfully, and Theo charged again. But this time, Theo moved at an alarmingly fast speed, making it hard to believe that he was the same person who had been struggling earlier. However, Peel quickly adapted to Theo's speed. At the young age of 15, she possessed three master level traits, mana ruler, weapon master, and sword master. She was truly favored by the gods. This was the first time she had faced a long sword since she returned home during the break. That narrow step, the loosely held wrist. The swordsmanship felt familiar. As Peel parried Theo's sword, she thrust her blade towards his chest. Whoosh. Her thin rapier made four swift, consecutive thrusts. However, she felt no resistance. Somehow, Theo evaded the thrusts and swung his sword with enough force to cleave Peel's body in two. Hong. The sound of air being torn apart filled the training field. However, the strength is good, but it's still slow. In human battles, speed was paramount. Peel narrowly dodged the sword by a hair's breadth. Simultaneously, the explosive momentum emanating from Theo vanished. Peel seized the opportunity. Thud. The thin practice weapon pierced Theo's thigh. I lost. Kneeling on the ground, Theo immediately conceded. Peel scrutinized him closely. He got a really great trait, huh? Why is this he ranked 181st? Then, she voiced the question that had come to mind earlier. Hey, where did you learn that swordsmanship from earlier? I learned it from my fiancé. Theo's face appeared somewhat drained. Peel's expression remained cold. Is that so? Come at me again. No, that's enough for today. I'm tired. With that, Theo hobbled over to a bench situated in the corner of the training field. Hey, let's go again. All right. The students who had been watching Theo and Peel's duel resumed their own training, weapons in hand. It seems like Theo's victory over Ralph wasn't just a fluke. If only I could gain one more trait. A ace they practiced, the students contemplated their situations. There wasn't a single top 30 ranked student who hadn't been defeated by Peel. Though Theo, ranked 181st, had been knocked down eight times, he persistently challenged her. The other students gave up after one or two attempts. Am I worse than Theo? That guy? Next time we have a one-on-one -on -one training session, I'll challenge Peel. Theo's fighting spirit was a huge motivation for them. Professor Mari Jane observed the students with a pleased expression. Phew. Wiping off her sweat, Peel looked at Theo, who was squatting on the bench. Did I go too far? Had she made Theo feel the despair of facing an insurmountable wall? Theo had his head down, dejected. The spirit that drove him to challenge Peel had vanished. After all, Theo's sword hadn't even grazed Peel's clothes. However, he didn't lose his fighting spirit, and the way he kept getting back up to attack was quite impressive. I want to fight him again next time. Wearing a somewhat satisfied smile, Peel approached Theo. Hey, are you alright? Peel patted Theo's slumped shoulders, but he didn't react. It seemed that Theo was genuinely upset. He has a rather cute side. Peel chuckled and continued. 
Hey, it's okay. There's no one here as persistent as you. I acknowledge that, but Theo still didn't respond. Did I go too far? It seemed that she had. In front of all his classmates, she had ruthlessly defeated him. If he had been a toy, it would have broken long ago. Feeling a bit guilty, Peel gently rubbed Theo's back with her palm. Hey, I'm sorry, okay? Come on. Don't be so upset about losing a spar. Z z z z z z. Peel leaned in closer to Theo, who still had his head down, and then muttered in disbelief. Crazy bastard. Theo was asleep, with an utterly peaceful expression on his face. Chapter ends. The afternoon lectures finally came to an end, concluding all of Monday's classes. Ugh. I managed to endure by pinching my thigh. Using overload for 10 seconds took a toll on my body. I calmed my trembling body and barely held back my eyelids from closing. Luckily, the practical evaluations following the duel, such as first aid and crisis management, weren't as physical, so I managed to endure them. That's why I used overload. Still, the practical evaluations were tough. If it were a theory class, I could sit back, relax, and let my mind wander. Ah, I'm tired. Let's go. Sure, there's a place near the dorms with great chocolate shakes. Want to stop by? Sounds good. I overheard students chatting. Was it the relief of having safely attended all the lectures? My tension eased, and drowsiness quickly washed over me. But I can't sleep yet. Today is Monday, the day of the Tactical Strategies Club's regular meeting. Subquest, join and actively participate in at least two clubs. Reward, two shop gold coins. I should have just done two. Why did I choose three? Despite that, the reward is too tempting. Oh well, I'll just do it. As I think about following Aisha, who had gone ahead of me. Here, Theo. Nocter approaches me, handing over a black bag. Judging by the texture, it's the traditional potion of the Nocter tribe. But it was as if he had psychic abilities. It just so happens that I finished the last one yesterday. How did you know I ran out? I thought you'd be out by now if you were consuming it regularly, so I brought some. Thanks, I'm off to club activities. I immediately chased after Aisha. Soon, I saw her sitting on a bench under a large tree. I caught my breath and approached her. Phew, Aisha. Sorry for being late. Seriously, Theo. Why were you so late? I've been waiting forever. The carriage just left, so let's take it slow. Understood. No. Okay, alright. Just say understood like you used to. Psy people might think I'm the bad guy here. Aisha and I maintained a distance of about three steps as we arrived at the bus stop in front of the hero department's main entrance. Ugh. Each step felt as though my body would give out. Step by step. With great effort, I boarded the carriage. Since most students had already boarded the previous one, the inside was quiet. Drowsiness swiftly enveloped me. I spoke to Aisha, who sat diagonally behind me, as politely as I could. Aisha, I have a favor to ask. Yes? Please wake me up when we arrive. Aisha looked at me with a puzzled expression. She'd probably grant me such a small favor, right? I trust you. With that, I fell asleep immediately. Aisha observed Theo, who was sitting far away, with a somber expression. Although they resembled each other, their appearances were distinct upon closer examination. Aisha's trait, sharp vision, activated. She could see the lustrous silver hair, the flawless white cheeks, and the delicate long eyelashes. The straight nose bridge and the sharp jawline were also visible. Her eyes were drawn to him. He resembled a beautiful sculpture crafted by a dwarf artisan. Aisha found it difficult to look away from Theo, who was leaning against the corner of the circular carriage with his eyes closed. SSS, SSS. She recalled his breathing, which she had heard back in the eastern forest. Somehow, it felt comforting. He looks so lovely when he's asleep. He must be exhausted. After the duel with Peel, he must have been heartbroken. Aisha understood, having dueled with Peel herself. Though she was ranked 6th, she felt an insurmountable gap against Peel, who was ranked 2nd. She never challenged her again, as further attempts would only bring her disgrace. Still, as a descendant of the Waldirk line, he should possess such spirit. But that doesn't mean he'll give up on being a family head. How much time had passed? An announcement played, and students flooded onto the carriage. Startled, Aisha immediately gazed out the window, as if she and Theo were strangers. However, once the students stopped streaming in, Aisha stole glances at Theo again. My throat feels incredibly parched. Ugh, um. Realizing the importance of sleeping posture, I woke up from my sleep. Looking around, I was still inside the carriage. Unlike before I fell asleep, it was now filled with students. And I saw Aisha, awkwardly gazing out the window. Peering outside, I estimated it would take about 10 more minutes to arrive. It's not the right time to doze off again. I just stared blankly out the window with bleary eyes. Theo and Aisha reached the Tactical Strategies Club meeting place. Fortunately, they were not late. The club members noticed that Theo appeared more lethargic than usual. His usual powerful aura was subdued. I'm glad we're not late. As Theo took his seat, the other club members exchanged knowing glances. He must be truly upset. It was practically a public execution. Peel went too far, regardless of her disdain for Theo, but the way he kept getting up, it was impressive. They seemed to understand and didn't disturb Theo. Even Andrew offered a sympathetic gaze. I went straight back to the dormitory after finishing the club activities. I skipped dinner. 
I didn't even possess the energy to chew and swallow food. Ah, this is absurd. I used it for only 10 seconds, and my body ended up in this condition? Will I genuinely be unable to get up tomorrow? You returned early today, young master. Amy bowed her head with a seemingly happy expression. I weakly nodded in acknowledgement. Go ahead and get some rest. Ha! Huh? It's not even 8 o'clock yet. I'll go to bed first. I didn't even have the energy to speak. Leaving behind Amy, who seemed to have something to say, I waved my hand and entered my room. I wanted to lie down immediately, but I couldn't go to bed without washing my dirty body first. My twisted noble's dignity would never let me hear the end of it. I had to wash up quickly. Gathering my strength, I headed to the bathroom. After swiftly rinsing my body, I lay down on the bed. Ha! Once I lay down, sleep didn't come easily. My duel with Peel came to mind. The difference in our level was too great. Even in my overlord state, I couldn't even graze her clothes. I wasn't angry or felt it was unfair. The gap between us was simply overwhelming. Our stats should have been similar for that moment. The difference lay in our traits, skills, and speed. The original game was oddly realistic in some ways. For example, there's an unrealistic setting like traits and awakenings, but at the same time, there's a very realistic setting where speed and technique are more important than strength in sword fights. Thanks to the Yi observer's eye, I wouldn't fall for the same technique twice, but Peel was a weapon master and a sword master. With these traits, she had achieved a level where she could create her own swordsmanship. If Peel's swordsmanship were a giant, mine would be a minuscule creature perched on the giant's shoulder. But I couldn't give up. All I could do was try. I'll do my best to mimic her. To analyze her. I need to land at least one hit on her this semester to feel satisfied, since I can't do anything about the traits for now. I should focus on honing my skills and speed. As I pondered that, I recalled Irene's words about visiting at least once a week. It hadn't sounded like a joke. Hugh, I should visit the night department tomorrow. Irene should be able to provide a solution. The next day, Tuesday, a lecture in the night department's classroom was well underway. For this reason, when facing an opponent wearing full plate armor, you should aim for the joints that the armor doesn't cover. That's why you should always carry a dagger. Despite being an honor student, Mina found it difficult to concentrate on the class. This was due to Irene, who had applied makeup for two consecutive days since enrolling at the academy, something she had never done before. Mina kept glancing at Irene, who wore makeup that did not suit her at all. Irene had fair, firm, and well-toned skin. Light makeup would have been more fitting, as if she had barely applied any. But it appeared she had used so much powder on her face that the color of her face and neck were mismatched, and her lips were a vivid crimson, as if bitten by a mouse. Her usual appearance is much prettier. Mina wasn't the only one who thought so, her peers also stole glances at Irene, their expressions filled with confusion. Even Jacob, who had confessed his feelings to Irene during the first semester and been rejected, looked appalled. Mina resolved to tell Irene the next day. Don't ever wear makeup like that again. Chapter ends. CH 31, all eyes on me, 4. Hmm, um hmm. Irene seemed excited, oblivious to Mina and the surrounding gazes. Occasionally, she even hummed through her nose. Irene, what's been going on with you lately? Mina couldn't contain her curiosity and asked. Ah, uh, no? Noth dash, nothing? Nothing's going on. Irene stuttered, her behavior quite strange and far from her usual confident demeanor. Something's definitely up. Mina immediately drew a conclusion. It's most likely a guy problem. Who could make Irene wear such terrible makeup? Could it be her handsome fiancé from that time? It was a reasonable deduction. No matter how sudden love could be, there was no way Irene would have a fling with someone from the night department out of the blue. She did look rather unusual when watching the match last week. Nina held back a chuckle. Irene reminded her of a 10-year-old girl secretly using her mother's makeup to impress a boy she liked. I'll let the makeup slide for now, but if she comes like this tomorrow, I'll have to say something. That face. No, she ruined her pretty face. Having made up her mind, Mina nodded. Time passed, and all of today's classes came to an end. Both the night and hero departments finished their classes at 4.30 p.m. However, even after 5 p.m., many students were still in the classrooms. With group project presentations approaching this Friday, the students were busy reading books and engaging in heated discussions with their teammates. Like them, Mina was also having a discussion with her teammates, including Irene. Yeah, so I think if the opponent tries to avoid a fight, there's no need to pursue them. What does everyone else think? Um, I think it's fine. But what if they run away and bring back more enemies? If we get surrounded, I don't think our group can break through. Ah, that's possible. Irene, what do you think? Ha? Huh? Oh. I think it's okay too. Nina sighed inwardly. Irene seemed to be lost in her thoughts. This girl is completely smitten. Throughout the lecture and even now, Irene's mind was filled with flowery fantasies. This was not the Irene she knew. Feeling somewhat jealous, Nina decided to move the conversation along. Since we probably won't make any progress today, how about we wrap up here? But let's each come up with one more idea by tomorrow. Sounds good. Yep. 
The other two group members responded, but there was no answer from Irene. Nina asked with a puzzled expression. Irene, what's really going on however, Nina's words were cut off. Suddenly, the sound of bustling voices came from outside the classroom. What's happening? The students in the classroom became curious about the commotion. Nina's group was no exception. Isn't he the swordsman from last week's evaluation match? What was his name again? I can't remember. But what business does he have in the night department? Wow, he's so handsome. What's so great about that spoiled brat? TSK. Various comments from the students could be heard. It was extremely easy to notice that their subject of conversation was Theo Lynn Waldirk. Mina suddenly regained her senses and looked at Irene. Irene was smiling shyly, like a princess who had just met the prince on a white horse from a fairy tale. Mina felt sorry. I should have told her today. Her makeup was odd. It would have been better not to wear any. However, Irene, who was unaware of that fact, still wore a gentle smile as she slowly stood up. Mina, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm sorry, I couldn't focus today. I'll think of two ideas for tomorrow instead. Ha? Huh? Oh, okay. T take care. Irene quickly packed her things and left the classroom. Mina could only watch her retreating figure. What's this? I was shocked. By Irene's bizarre appearance. They say women use makeup like transformation magic. But the direction she took was way off. Even I, who has never had any experience with women, could sense it. What happened? She seemed in a good mood, judging by the faint smile on her face. Irene. Regardless, I had come all the way to the night department and needed to achieve my goal. Appearances weren't important, I was just taken aback for a moment. Yes, Theo. Dot. Her radiant smile made her appearance even more jarring. I felt a tingling shock. Twisted noble's dignity, activated, likely because Irene's appearance did not align with Theo's aesthetic sense at all. Even the surrounding students were staring at me. It was a shameful display. However, this damned trait also helped me in maintaining my composure. I took a deep breath internally and spoke. Irene. There's something important I need to discuss with you. Important? So suddenly? WH what is it about? It's not appropriate to talk about it here. Let's move somewhere else. I didn't want to endure any more embarrassment. All right. Fortunately, Irene nodded obediently. We went to a quiet cafe nearby. So you're asking for more help with swordsmanship? Irene asked, narrowing her eyes. Yes. There's something I want to ask you, Theo. What is it? By any chance, was the important matter you mentioned about training? That's correct. I had been beaten like a dog by peel, so what could be more important than this conversation? Yes, what else could be more pressing right now? Right. I understand. Very well then. Ugh. Her tone shifted slightly. And she let out a deep sigh. Let's head to the training grounds. She finished her barely touched iced coffee in one gulp and stood up. As I was slowly rising, ah, uh, hurry up. You said it was important. Irene's sharp words flew towards me. Ah, uh, okay. Feeling the urgency in Irene's tone, I hastily stood up. At the training grounds, I received instruction from Irene. However, it was more like torture disguised as training. Peel's beating was merely a warm-up. The intensity left me breathless. Huk, huk, huk. Dot. I lay sprawled on the ground, gasping for air. Irene, looking somewhat refreshed, gazed down at me and said, let's call it a day. All right, I understand. Still unable to rise, I simply responded. I'll head out first then. All right. Thanks, anyway. Irene. I'm always grateful. As long as you know. Irene furrowed her brow and slowly exited the training grounds. I didn't even suggest grabbing a meal together, knowing she would obviously decline. A few minutes later, my breathing steadied, and I got up to shower and change clothes. Hunger is setting in. Should I eat something before heading back? However, after enduring these challenges over the past few days, I felt I deserved some sort of reward. I didn't want to dine at the nearby shabby restaurant with its tasteless fare. I went to the dormitory and asked Amy to prepare a simple meal. I thought she would be slightly annoyed but, she gladly agreed. She even seemed somewhat happy about it. While eating the food Amy prepared, I thought about my plans for tomorrow. Tomorrow is Wednesday, the day of the practical evaluation. Of course, I'm aware of the evaluation's focus, monster subjugation. In the original game, to highlight the Neek's extraordinary strength, monsters too difficult for first-year students would appear. Neek perseveres, and in true protagonist fashion, ultimately defeats the creatures. 
He would gather his team and even take care of the monsters of other teams. After that, Neek would receive recognition not only from the students who had been subtly belittling him, but also from the professors. In the original work, Theo's group was naturally omitted, but it's likely that monsters of similar strength to what Neek faced will appear. The Great King Beetle It's a monster difficult for all students, except for Neek, to handle at this point. I just need to stay calm, and I'll get a good score. In the midst of everyone else's panic, simply maintaining my composure should earn me a generous score. Having finished my thoughts, I placed the empty dish on the table and relaxed. Let's absorb everything I learned today into my body. With my eyes closed, I took a deep breath. I recalled the numerous techniques I had observed with, observer's eye. I thought about the various techniques I had seen during last week's evaluation, Irene's practical skills, and Peel's swift movements. For a long time, their forms danced vividly in my mind. Chapter Ends CH32 Walking the Rope 1. In the game Karenzina Chronicles, a monster is classified as such if it meets both of the following conditions, first, it possesses intelligence far inferior to that of humans, akin to beings with intelligence lower than that of a three-year-old human child. Some beastmen or orcs might experience a sharp decline in intelligence when they lose their rationality, but they are not classified as monsters because they do not exhibit this behavior under normal circumstances. Second, they exhibit an instinctive hostility towards humans. This is an even more reliable distinction than intelligence. Monsters cannot suppress their hostility towards humans and attack them on sight. That is why demons, demon kings, and ancient dragons who have been considered enemies of humanity since ancient times are not classified as monsters. This is because they generally possess higher intelligence than humans and do not indiscriminately display hostility. One of the most common tasks performed by active heroes is monster subjugation. Of course, requesting a hero's assistance is costly, so the main targets are powerful monsters that mercenary guilds cannot handle. For example, there are great king beetles, drakes, and krakens. These are large monsters that are extremely difficult for ordinary people to face and are more efficiently dealt with by one superhuman than 100 soldiers. However, most monsters are too powerful for a hero to face alone unless they are top ranked. Therefore, when undertaking monster subjugation missions, it is common practice to work with aides or form parties with other hero teams. Wednesday arrived, the day of the practical evaluation. Today's evaluation subject is monster subjugation. Over 200 first year hero department students and field staff members boarded five 45 seater carriages and headed towards the western forest. Of course, they would not be subjugating actual monsters. There are dozens of mock training dungeons in the western forest created by the Archmage Odious. Like the exclusive training grounds for the hero department, the mock training dungeons can be customized to suit various preferences. The surrounding environment, size, monster species, and even the number of monsters can be adjusted with precision. Though the magic training grounds have limitations compared to reality and the mock monsters may be somewhat lacking, they're sufficient for assessing the abilities of first-year students. As they arrived at the western forest, the carriages came to a halt. The students who disembarked at their destination clustered together and chatted. What kind of monsters do you think we'll face? I heard from the seniors that they had to deal with giant cockatrices. Maybe something like that? Oh, that sounds manageable. I hope I get a good team. Please, let me get a mage, a mage. Please, let me get a tanker, a tanker. I hope I end up in the same team as Max. I also chatted with Noctur and my orc classmates. I hope we end up in the same team, Theo. Me too. Don't go beating up mages on your team, Noctur. Of course not. A true warrior knows when and where to fight. Even if they're mages, once they become part of the same team, they're brothers. Another orc classmate approached me. I'd like to be on the same team as you too, Theo. Who was he again? Ah, who are you? I'm Tarkhan. I'm a warrior from the Blue Sand Tribe. As we conversed, plod, plod, plod dot. Dot. When the bald professor, Rock, and the field instructors strode in imposingly, the chattering stopped immediately. Rock emitted an aura that even high-ranking nobles would struggle to emanate. Students naturally lined up before Rock, overwhelmed. Rock slowly scanned the students before speaking. You've already heard the details yesterday, so I won't repeat them. I'll simply announce the team compositions, which I'm sure you're all curious about. As Rock finished speaking, a petite teaching assistant, who always followed him around, hung a scroll on the wooden signboard with a grumble. The composition of the evaluation teams, similar to the dual evaluation, was determined by the hero department. However, the selection was not entirely random. As the lowest ranking student, I would likely be paired with a top ranking student. While the monster subjugation itself was important, a hero had to be able to lead a diverse group of team members. That's the underlying message. Since the majority of us were still young, only a few of us were able to fully comprehend this. Who's on my team? Ah, shoot. Wait, I'm with Neek. I'm on the same team as Neek. 
Nice. He he. Nice to meet you, e child. I'm Travis. Most of the students were simply happy to be teamed up with higher ranked classmates. A typical hero team comprises one hero and four supporting aides. Accordingly, the scroll displayed 40 teams, each with five members. The full scale joint practical evaluations with aides would take place at the end of the first year. Naturally, there were no aides at the moment, only prospective heroes. Let's see who I'm with. I quickly scanned the scroll and soon found my team. Team 2, Peel slash Ralph slash Samir slash Ivelia slash Tarkhan, Team 6, Aisha slash Brad slash Peter slash Lishan slash Gerber, Team 10, Ishal slash Sienna slash Max slash Travis slash Theo, this is unfortunate. I sighed inwardly. Ishild is certainly competent, as is Max Travis shares my low ranking, but Max, being the 51st, was quite exceptional, so that was fine. The issue, as anticipated, is Sienna. She is the sole elf in the first year, and her ranking for the school year is 74th. It's high, but not exceptionally so. However, Sienna possessed a unique ability, spirit magic, that no one else could match. A unique ability differs from a trait, it's more akin to a supernatural power. Firstly, those who possess unique abilities are exceedingly rare. Furthermore, Sienna is a spirit wizard, as scarce as a 7th circle high mage or even rarer. Her 74th place ranking isn't due to a lack of skill. Rather, she simply doesn't care much about her grades. If she put her mind to it, she would undoubtedly be in the top 10. I must never get entangled with her. I am already quite involved with other students, unlike in the original game, causing the future to change significantly. However, I must never get entangled with Sienna. The future changing is one thing, but once she takes a liking to someone, she treats them like a plaything. In the game, Neek suffered greatly because of her. As I was thinking this, hello, everyone, Sienna brushed her golden hair behind her ears and greeted her teammates. All the team members except me smiled awkwardly. It's understandable. After all, her outward appearance is that of an elf, more beautiful than anyone else in the world. Nice to meet you? I, I'm also glad to meet you. Let's do our best, Sienna, um, ma'am. Max and Travis awkwardly exchanged greetings. In the hero department, excluding special cases like Aisha, students usually use informal speech with one another. However, Sienna, with her stunning appearance and being a 150-year-old elf, exuded an air of dignity that made her difficult to approach casually. In fact, Sienna is also the princess of the wood elf tribe living in the Great Forest. Nice to meet you, Sienna. Since we're classmates, let's use informal speech. Glad to meet you. Of course, Ishild and I spoke informally to her. She looked at us with an amused expression. Of course, feel free to speak comfortably. I didn't need her to say that. I was already planning on it. Fortunately, Twisted Noble's dignity did not activate. When I first spoke with the orc, it had activated. Was it because Sienna was a beautiful elf princess? Sienna smiled and continued the conversation. By the way, I heard from other students that the monster we're going to subjugate this time is a giant cockatrice. How about we come up with a strategy for that? Great idea. Max and Travis responded. I agree too. Honestly, I have no idea how to plan strategies. You guys should do it. I'll just follow the plan. Ishild also replied. It's not a giant cockatrice, but a great king beetle. I won't say anything, though. I remain silent. Theo, what do you think? How should we proceed? Sienna inquired pointedly. I had to choose my words carefully. Apologies, I was lost in thought. I believe I have a sound plan. Max, Travis, and I can hinder the cockatrice's movements while Ishile provides ranged support. That seems to be the safest approach. That appears to be a solid strategy. You're as insightful as you were during the lecture. What should I do? Managing the exploration would be ideal. With the assistance of spirits, you'll likely locate the monster faster than any other team. Oh, I see. What about the rest of you? I agree. Of course, I'm in favor too. Just listening to the plan sounds plausible. I hate using my head, anyway. Leave the attacking to me, I'm confident. Everyone agreed. Sienna gazed at me meaningfully and smiled. Suddenly, I felt uneasy. It was best to avoid drawing the attention of that intensely obsessed elf girl. As our discussion continued, an instructor interjected. Team representatives should obtain an emergency communication crystal. Let's hope you won't need to use it. As Ishail shrugged, Sienna cast one more glance at me before going to collect the emergency communication crystal. Chapter ends. CH 33, Walking the Rope, 2. Monster subjugating missions aren't limited to simply defeating monsters. They involve the entire process of traveling to the monster's habitat, tracking them, and ultimately eliminating them. 
Thus, the difficulty of these missions is not solely based on the strength of the monsters. Although uncommon, cockatrice subjugation can sometimes be more challenging than exterminating krakens. The varied habitats of monsters also play a part. Some warriors excel on grasslands, while others dominate at sea. A warrior capable of easily taking down the cockatrice battle captain on grasslands may find themselves unable to handle a baby kraken at sea. Moreover, a monster's strength generally corresponds with its age. Within the same species, a five-year-old monster will be much stronger than one that is only six months old. Additionally, long-lived monsters are known as named monsters. Instinctively, other monsters naturally gather around a named monster as their leader. At this point, the level of the monsters in the group significantly increases, and they have increasingly fewer weak points to exploit. Monsters primarily rely on their inherent physical abilities. As a result, the presence of just one named monster can drastically increase the difficulty of subjugation. Examples of named monsters include the great king beetles, giant cockatrices, and others. Among the named cockatrices are those with distinctive yellow feathers, such as cockatrice battle captains, and those with striking red feathers, like cockatrice commanders. We moved quickly over the grasslands, which were, of course, also created by magic. Hmm, but a grassland-type dungeon? It doesn't seem likely for a great king beetle to emerge here. Originally, it was a desert landscape. Since the future has changed quite a bit, there might be a possibility that the great king beetle won't appear. Nevertheless, grasslands are the primary habitat of cockatrices. I wonder if Nocter is doing well. Before entering the dungeon, I told Nocter and his orc friends to use the emergency communication crystal if they felt it was too dangerous. Especially since Nocter was partnered with the wizard, Andrew, he might become arrogant. I hope they understood. Due to my actions, the futures of Nocter and the orcs have likely changed. Like Theo, Nocter is an extra character who, in most routes, tragically dies early after getting caught up in an incident at the end of the first year. In the current Spearman route, he is a doomed character with only a brief mention of his death. I feel a sense of camaraderie, I wanted to help him somehow. As we continued in the direction Sienna pointed out, look over there. Travis gestured towards the top of the hill. There, a giant monster resembling a chicken walking on two legs appeared. It was a cockatrice. Ah, as expected of a spirit wizard. Impressive. Ishild swiftly launched a spell at the cockatrice. It would inflict significant damage if it struck a vital point. But somehow, it's too small? The cockatrice seemed rather small for a giant one, barely medium-sized. Is it different from what I saw in the game because I'm witnessing it firsthand now? Or is it because I'm observing it from a distance? Regardless, encountering a monster so quickly is good news. Ah, what a shame. I aimed for its legs. Key, key eek. The cockatrice, struck by Ishiles on its wing, let out a piercing shriek. Ah, that wasn't a clean hit. It's too far away. If it were only about 30 meters closer, I would have definitely hit it. Ishild clicked his tongue. The wing wasn't the cockatrice's weak point. Naturally, it hurt since the spell struck its bare flesh, but cockatrices were resilient creatures. To immobilize it, one should aim for its legs. To kill it with a single strike, target vital areas like its neck or heart. At least you hit it. I can barely see it. Ah, it's fleeing. What are you doing? Hurry and pursue it. Ishile shouted at his teammates and started running at the forefront. As expected of an assassin, his agility was exceptional. He's incredibly fast. Ishile's figure had already disappeared into the distance. Max, Travis, and I hurriedly followed after him. Dot. Sienna, on the other hand, was leisurely pretending to run. Even so, there wasn't much difference in speed between us. Really, spirit wizards are overpowered. She must have been receiving assistance from wind spirits. Die, you. As he ran, he shiled continuously hurled spells at the cockatrice. Of course, the cockatrice also ran away, maintaining its distance. Key, key. During this, the cockatrice skillfully blocked he shiled's magic targeting its legs with its massive wings. Something about this situation seemed off. It was difficult to expect such behavior as blocking its legs from a regular cockatrice unless it was being instructed. A typical monster should have charged at Ishild in anger the moment it was hit by a spell on its wing for the first time. We played tag with the cockatrice for over three minutes. What is that? Ishild muttered under his breath, his face pale as he stared at the approaching flock of cockatrices. A few seconds later, all team members spotted the flock of cockatrices. Despair filled Ishild, Max, and Travis's eyes. This is hopeless. I quickly assessed the situation. There were at least ten of them. A flock of cockatrices that size would normally require a team of active, intermediate-level heroes for confrontation. And one of them even had yellow feathers. A named cockatrice battle captain was among them. 
We needed to activate the emergency communication crystal. Sienna, activate the emergency communication crystal. Got it despite the tense situation, Sierra cheerfully responded and activated the emergency communication crystal. Once activated, the supervising instructors would arrive in approximately five minutes. In any case, we have to survive against this flock of cockatrices for nearly five minutes. Escaping wasn't a viable option for us. Cockatrices were as fast as a child, the quickest member of our team. Uh, uh, what do we do? Damn it, why, why, why are they suddenly appearing in a flock? Weren't we only supposed to catch one giant cockatrice? Max and Travis whimpered. Damn, this is a disaster. As a child moved, he threw magic at the approaching flock of cockatrices. Due to their large numbers, he couldn't inflict significant damage. Sigh. I was scared too. It was impossible to stay calm, much like when a ghost jump scares in a horror game. In a game, it's okay to fail. You can always try again. But the situation I'm in now, reality, is different. One mistake could cause us to fall from the rope and perish. The only difference between me and the others was that, due to, Twisted Noble's dignity, I didn't exhibit any outward signs of fear. But I was just like them. Only Sienna seemed unfazed. Instead, she appeared to be anticipating something. As if the situation was amusing, a faint smile even graced her lips. Confidence that she could alter the situation with her own strength at any moment, I presumed. If Sienna uses even half of her power, she could easily bind them. What a pervert. I really don't want to be involved with that elf. Well, I never expected her help anyway. I immediately devised a plan. The goal was to survive until the instructors arrived. We had to hold out for at least five minutes. So scary, so scary, so scary. Dot. What should we do, child? I don't know either, damn it. I wanted to win against Jang Wahi at least once. However, it was impossible with these kids who had already given up and lost their composure. If the cockatrice flock gets a little closer, they might each run away. I had to prevent such a situation at all costs. Travis, gather rocks right now. If they approach, throw them and circle around us. Don't be scared, only one or two cockatrices will follow you. I promptly gave orders to my teammates. A ship needs a captain, and a team needs a leader. E child, use your spells. However, the closer you get to the cockatrice, the easier it will be to target their weak points. Unlike Travis, focus on reducing their numbers. In urgent situations, we need to act as one. As we learned in the introduction to hero studies, even if the head gives the wrong order, the arms and legs must execute it flawlessly. Max, ready your shield to block the cockatrice flock. I'm scared. With your ability, you can withstand their attacks to some extent. But, but dot. If you don't raise your shield now, everyone here will die. I'll make up for our weaknesses. You can do it. Having said that, I drew my practice longsword and stood near Max Travis, with a blank look in his eyes, picked up a rock. Damn it, if I'm going to die anyway, might as well go all out. Eshild slid a ring imbued with spells onto his finger. Okay, I'll give it a try. Dot. Max also raised his tower shield. I glanced at Sienna, who wore an interesting expression, and then focused on the approaching monsters. Chapter ends. CH34, walking the rope, 3. My strategy worked well. Surprisingly well for something improvised. Keek. Key. Two cockatrices were lured by Travis's stone throwing and chased after him. Travis, sporting a contorted expression, sprinted with all his might. In the meantime, Ishild efficiently incapacitated the two cockatrices with his magic. All that remained were seven regular cockatrices and one cockatrice battle captain. Fortunately, Max's taunt succeeded. While Max blocked the assaults of three cockatrices with his shield, Ishild confronted the remaining two. So, I ended up confronting the leader, the cockatrice battle captain, one on one. I can win. I was confident. I could win in a one on one battle. Even though the cockatrice battle captain is a named monster, it's weaker than the real thing because it was created by magic. Besides, I know the perfect strategies for all types of named monsters. Let's see. The cockatrice battle captain maintained a certain distance from me, as if studying me. In this respect, it indeed resembled a named monster. However, its combat power wasn't overwhelmingly higher than that of a regular cockatrice. Given that it's a magical monster, its actual combat power might be on par with a giant cockatrice. The battle captain's body was covered with tough feathers, but I could easily penetrate them with my practice longsword. It's rather fortunate, I guess. If it had been a great king beetle, whose skin was nearly impenetrable to a sword, I wouldn't have stood a chance without Sienna's assistance. As I confronted the battle captain and contemplated all this, I heard Sienna's voice from behind me. Do you need help? I responded without taking my eyes off the battle captain. No. 
It's best not to get involved with that pervert. Unless I'm on the brink of death, I can defeat the battle captain. Hee hee, I see. Just as Sienna smiled contentedly, ki, ki, ki. The cockatrice battle captain let out a screech and charged at me. Its speed was much faster compared to a regular cockatrice. However, my observer's eye could even detect the swift strikes of experts like Peel and Irene. A simple attack from a monster was easy to discern. Judging by its stride and the direction of its beak. Ha! Huh? The battle captain wasn't targeting me. Its target was Sienna, who was behind me. That cunning elf must have done something. Otherwise, there was no reason for the battle captain, who had been confronting me until now, to suddenly charge at her. It was probably spirit magic. Not fire or water, but wind, perhaps? Regardless, the enraged monster exposed its weakness. It was a clear opportunity. Swish. I immediately slashed the monster's two legs with my practice longsword. Key, key. Eek. Of course, since it was a practice weapon, I couldn't cleanly sever the creature's legs, but I seem to have succeeded in breaking both of them. As proof, the battle captain let out a pitiful scream and collapsed to the ground. I approached the creature with my sword drawn. The battle captain looked up at me and cried sadly. Die. Of course, I had no intention of showing mercy. I needed to kill this thing quickly and go help my teammates. I gripped the long sword hard and cut its throat. Its neck was cut about a third of the way through. Swish, swish. I swung my sword in the same spot several times, and soon the battle captain's head was severed. Dot. There was no grotesque scene of blood spurting like a fountain. The headless corpse of the battle captain disappeared as if it had never existed. Keek. Keeee. -e -e. The ordinary cockatrices then started to go berserk. They screamed and flapped their wings and beaks wildly. I quickly returned to my teammates. Max, can you hold on a little longer? Uh, yeah. Max, surrounded by a blue mana shield, answered. The cockatrices were continuously striking the shield. Judging by the density of the mana, it seemed he still had some room to spare. His defensive capabilities were truly top-notch. Just hold on a little longer, I'll be right there. At the same time, I charged at two cockatrices playing tag with Travis. Squeak. I quickly dealt with them. The ambushed cockatrices disappeared without a trace, just like the battle captain. Regular cockatrices were easy to deal with if there were no named ones. I spoke to Travis. Travis, supporty child. I'll deal with the ones attacking Max. Ah, got it. Travis, who had been throwing stones, now drew his short spear and joined Ishild. Damn, I thought I was going to die. Having run out of magic, Ishild was confronting a cockatrice with his dagger drawn. All right, they're taken care of. I approached the cockatrice that was continuously hitting Max's tower shield. I was already quite exhausted. However, even in this state, as long as there were no named monsters, I could handle ordinary cockatrices. With that thought in mind, I approached the cockatrice. Ki, ki. Kiowa. Their movements stopped temporarily. No, it's not that they stopped. They were caught. The cockatrices were immobilized, only able to scream. Is it Sienna's spirits? It was just a guess. People without spirit affinity can't see or feel spirits, unlike magic. Of course, I have no affinity at all, so I can't feel them. I sighed inwardly and repeatedly stabbed the sharp end of my weapon into the necks of the cockatrices. I must have stabbed each one about five times. Like the battle captain, they vanished as if they never existed. I moved toward Ishild and Travis while casting a glance at Sienna. She just flashed a playful smile at me. Really, it looks so unrealistic. As if she's on a picnic by herself. I quickly looked away and joined Ishild and Travis. However, as soon as I approached the cockatrices, ki, ki, Just like before, the cockatrices stopped. What the hell? Why are they suddenly acting like this? Anyway, let's just kill them quickly. Ishild and Travis tilted their heads, confused, and killed the cockatrices. With that, there were no remaining cockatrices. We had one. Wow, damn. We survived. Seriously, it feels like I aged 10 years. Ahoo, aho huck. Ishild, Travis, and Max hugged each other, celebrating their victory. Strange. I looked at my wristwatch with a sinking feeling. Eight minutes had passed since we encountered the flock of cockatrices. The instructors who should have arrived within five minutes still haven't come. The implication was clear. The other teams were also in danger. It's unfolding just like the original. I addressed my team members, except for Sienna, who were still rejoicing. The battle isn't over yet. There's a high probability that the other teams are also in trouble. 
I understand that you want to celebrate, but we need to set it aside for now. It's time to go help our classmates. But, the other teams must have shattered their emergency communication crystals, wouldn't the instructors go help them? Given that no instructor has come to our aid yet, it's reasonable to assume that the other teams are facing similar predicaments. Max, I understand your sentiments. You just finished fighting and want to rest for a while. But as heroes, we must persevere. And so, I encouraged my teammates. Of course, it wasn't easy for me either. However, someone out there desperately needs our help. Initially, a great king beetle should have appeared in the original scenario, but we encountered a flock of cockatrices instead. The people of this world are experiencing a changed future due to the countless butterfly effects I've caused. I think I bear some responsibility. And right now, we are in a position to help. I'll seize this opportunity to earn some reputation points for sure. I swallowed that selfish thought. There's no point in letting it show. Ishild, Max, and Travis hastily readied themselves. In the meantime, I observed Sienna. She was still looking at me with a faint smile, for some reason, it gave me chills. Damn, I really shouldn't get involved with her. However, my sense of responsibility won. Can you find another team for us? Hee <laughs> hee, of course. I've been waiting for you to ask. Sienna smiled sweetly. Wait a moment, Theo. She closed her eyes for a moment and then spoke. There's another team in this direction, about one kilometer away. A human woman using a bow. That must be Aisha. Since we entered the same dungeon, I was sure of it. Thanks. I spoke to the unhappy trio. It looks like we're ready, let's get going. Chapter ends. CH 35, walking the rope, 4. We quickly located Aisha's team. Just as Sienna had said, they were at the exact location. Even from afar, their condition didn't look great. Ah, seriously. If only we didn't have these practice weapons. Aisha's voice, thick with frustration, carried to us. Let's hurry. I urged my teammates. Understood. Theo. Isn't that Aisha's voice? Come on. Let's pick up the pace. Max, Travis, and Ishild, the unhappy trio hastened their steps. He he dot. Sienna, however, continued to enjoy herself as if on a leisurely stroll. The gods can be cruel indeed. The fact that they bestowed a unique ability like spirit magic upon someone as perverse as her seemed unfair. At least, it was a relief she was on our side. Sienna, the 150-year-old wood elf princess of the Great Forest, was already a complete expert, unlike the other students who were still inexperienced. Though she only used her power when it suited her. Well, if someone like her ran wild without limits, it would break the balance. I mused as we ran. Soon, our team reached the outskirts of the battlefield. Ugh, as expected, the situation doesn't look good. Ishild clicked his tongue, preparing magic on his finger. Six regular cockatrices remained. The battle captain was still alive. How have they held on this long? Aisha's team had likely been fighting the cockatrice flock for more than ten minutes. The fact that they hadn't been wiped out was impressive. Damn it, when will the instructors arrive? Over there, on the left. Watch out, Aisha. One got through. Ugh, thanks. Seriously, take some hits, will you? Aisha's team hadn't noticed our presence and continued to battle the cockatrices with grim expressions. Aisha possessed remarkable vision thanks to her sharp vision trait, but it seemed she was too preoccupied to notice us. The cockatrices are targeting Aisha, the team's ace. Their intelligence is higher with the battle captain present. Ishild. I know, Theo. No need to say it. Ishild shot a spell from his fingers, although it had less mana than when we first entered the dungeon. Screech. It was still a significant threat to the nearby cockatrices. The two hit in the legs screamed in pain. Since they were focusing on Aisha's team, they had no chance to avoid the attack. Ishild, it's Ishild. Huh, what? He's here, reinforcements have arrived. We're saved. Color returned to Aisha's team's faces. I immediately issued orders to my teammates. Max, stay close to Aisha. Understood. Max charged forward, raising his shield in front of Aisha with surprising vigor, despite his lackluster response earlier. Ah, uh, are you Max? Hello, Aisha. Hide behind me. Al. Right. Aisha quickly took cover behind Max's large frame and shot arrows at the cockatrices. At this rate, they should be able to handle the regular cockatrices. The key was the battle captain. When facing a group of monsters, it was a basic tactic to eliminate the leader first. Aisha is still a newbie. It's understandable. Even the smart Aisha has no raid experience at this point. 
Travis, let's take on the cockatrice battle captain together. Why yes. Hesitation vanished from Travis's steps. We both rushed toward the battle captain, who stood slightly apart from the group. We'll take it down in one shot. It was just like the one I faced earlier. However, the difference now was that I had Travis with me. Travis, like Theo, was a low-ranking student, but he was better than nothing. As a hero department student, his stats were similar to Irene's, who was the top student in the night department. As we approached the cockatrice battle captain, we looked for an opening. Key, key. Just like before, the battle captain screeched in terror and charged towards Sienna. What kind of hobby is this, exactly? Does she want to mimic a captured princess? It's hard to understand the hobbies of perverts. Anyway, there's a clear opening. Travis, aim for its left wing. Okay, Travis immediately dove into the left side of the battle captain. The battle captain turned its eyes to the left. I lowered my upper body and lunged in from the right. Swish. I slashed its leg. It's a technique I learned from Irene and practiced countless times. Key, K-A. The battle captain wobbled and screeched. It didn't fall, but its balance was broken, which meant the end was near. Travis, focus on its left side. Got it. Opposite Travis, I focused its right side. Soon, the dead battle captain vanished as if it had never existed. Whoa. We won. Travis jumped around like a child before hugging me. I really don't like hugging other men even in situations like this. However, I allowed Travis his moment. While being hugged by him, I scanned the area with weary eyes. At some point, all the cockatrices had vanished. That's a relief. Only our team and Aisha's team had entered this dungeon. Two teams in total. Somehow, I had done everything within my power. I'm not a superhuman like Neek or Peel. It's beyond my capabilities now. As I contemplated that and surveyed my surroundings, my eyes met Sienna's, who was observing me with an intrigued expression. We really make eye contact often. How come we always lock eyes when I glance her way? No Sienna seemed to have been watching me all along. Ha! Huh. Chills ran down my spine. It appears I've caught her attention. Sienna is grinning slyly, like a child who discovered a new toy. I quickly averted my gaze from her and attempted to detach Travis from my body. Theo! Did your team also encounter a flock of cockatrices? Aisha approached me and initiated a conversation. Yes. I see. Anyway, it's a relief that we're all alive. And, thank you for coming to our rescue. Yes. Would it hurt to use more pleasant words? I'm grateful for the help, but still. Last time, you told me to keep it short. Oh, well, that was then. Can't a man have a personality at all? All right, I got it. Aisha looked at me with exasperated eyes. What does she want me to do? Travis, let's go. Ah, okay. I walked with Travis towards the other students who had gathered. Oh, seriously. Theo, you. Are you doing this on purpose? Let's go together. Aisha followed us like a duckling trailing its mother. Upon arriving at the group of students, I surveyed the scene and said, it seems there are no casualties. A child spoke up. So what do we do now, Theo? Our instructors are nowhere to be found. The other students seemed to be waiting for my answer, as they all looked at me. I immediately assessed the situation. Ten people in total. There are injured, but thankfully no casualties. However, moving would be difficult. Although our team was in good condition, Aisha's team had three severely injured students. Of course, there were no students with healing traits or abilities. First, we need to provide first aid for the injured. Waiting was the best option. In the original story, after the incident occurred, the instructors found Neek 30 minutes later. The future has changed a lot, but they should arrive within an hour. Currently, there are only 10 of us in this magic dungeon. After taking care of the injured, we'll wait for the instructors on that hill. All right. Then let's do as Theo, no, our temporary leader says. At Ishile's response, the other students nodded in agreement. Instead of nodding, Sienna was still smiling at me. After about 15 minutes, the instructors arrived. They seemed to have rushed, as they couldn't hide their panting even in front of the students. So, you're saying that a flock cockatrices appeared, and you all took care of them? Yes, to be more precise, our team handled our own flock, then moved to assist the other team. A child, who had nearly died, couldn't speak politely. A child, were you the one leading? No way, I can't do that sort of thing. Theo over there was our temporary leader. I see. The instructors glanced at me, nodded their heads, and continued speaking. Let's discuss the details outside the dungeon. Injured students, let us carry you. 
The instructors bent down, offering their backs to the injured students. After a moment's hesitation, they accepted the help. Ugh. Just bear with it for a moment. Healers are waiting outside. Let's move right away. We followed the instructors out of the dungeon. The situation outside was quite chaotic. What a mess. Chapter ends. CH 36, walking the rope, 5. Outside, it was chaotic. Ugh, ugh. My arm. My arm won't move. The area near the magic dungeon entrance teemed with injured people. Even the instructors, composed of active heroes up to intermediate level, had suffered various wounds. Healers bustled about, treating the injured without pause. The situation resembled the original work, but witnessing it firsthand, it felt even more vivid. Not all the students had escaped from the dungeon yet. The number of people gathered was far too small compared to the 200 first-year students. My eyes quickly scanned for Nocter and his orc companions. There were no deaths in the original work. However, unlike the original work, the types of monsters that appeared in the dungeon were different. Additionally, the instructor's delayed rescue of the students cast uncertainty on the outcome. Hopefully, there would be no issues. Ah. Fortunately, I was able to find Nocter and his orc students. They sat calmly beneath a large tree, awaiting treatment. They had sustained serious injuries, but not enough to quell an orc spirit. I approached them. Did you guys encounter a flock of cockatrices as well? Yep. We could have easily dealt with those bird-brained monsters if we had better weapons. What a shame. Nocter spoke nonchalantly. However, his injuries were quite severe. His left arm was broken, and it appeared several of his ribs were broken as well. I spoke sternly. This is not the time to put up a strong front, Nocter. Actually, I almost died. If it weren't for Andrew, that mage friend, I would have been done for. I see. As I chatted with Nocter and his orc friends, Senior Professor Rock appeared. His serious expression had intensified. Rock clapped his hands and announced, I know this is very confusing, but we'll be conducting interviews to understand what transpired inside the magic dungeon. When your name is called, come to the individual interview room. Oh, and classes will be cancelled until we resolve this situation. Despite the welcome news of class cancellations, not a single student seemed happy. It was understandable, as most of them had faced near-death experiences just moments earlier. Aside from Neek's team, Peel's team, and our team, everyone else had teetered on the brink of death. Fortunately, this aligns with the original work. I surveyed the area once more. Neek and Peel's teams appeared to be in good condition. About 30 minutes later, an instructor called the students' names one by one. All students responded. Sure enough, there were no casualties. As I was passing the time with Nocter and the Orc students, Theo, Professor Rock is calling for you. I was going to have an interview with Professor Rock, not just any instructor. In the original work, Rock had met with Neek. Why me? Leaving behind the surprised stares of the other students, I headed towards the individual interview room where Rock was waiting. More than four hours had passed since I started my in-depth interview with Rock. Before I knew it, it was already past 4 p.m., that's enough for today. It was a very informative time, Theo. Rock displayed more interest in me than I anticipated. In the original story, Neek's interview ended in under 10 minutes. I shook hands with Rock, who offered his hand. Yes, it was an informative time for me as well, Professor. I'll take my leave now. All right, be careful on your way. Rock nodded with a satisfied expression. That bald man certainly has some dignity. Undoubtedly, he must be concealing something as well. I don't know what it is since it wasn't in the original story, but I had the impression he could be at least the son of a high-ranking noble family. Anyway, I need to rest today. Both my body and mind were exhausted. With that thought, I left the private room. Afterward, I straightened my shirt collar and adjusted my overall appearance. By now, the interviews for the later called students should be nearly complete. Hoo! Taking a deep breath, I recalled my most pressing issue. Sienna has shown interest in me. As much as I'd like to deny it, the fact remains. Sienna, an elf princess renowned for her beauty and popularity, seldom takes interest in others. That's why, even after a semester had passed, she barely knew the names of most of her classmates. Yet Sienna displayed blatant interest in me. In the original story, she was openly obsessed with those who intrigued her. I don't know why she's interested in me. I remember what Sienna said to Neek during their second year in the original story. He he, Neek. You are the hero I have dreamed of since I was little. Sienna saw the protagonist of a novel she had read as a child in Neek. I know the general story of that novel. The protagonist of that novel was, as befitting a protagonist, overwhelmingly powerful. He was a true hero who, together with his team, defeated the Demon King. He was the polar opposite of Theo. 
My sole goal is to graduate from the hero department with excellent grades. I neither have the time nor inclination to entertain Sienna. I'm not a pushover like Neek. I need to consider how to respond. It's difficult to simply push her away. Then, I need to gradually diminish her interest in me. As I pondered and prepared to leave, I heard her voice. Hee hee, Theo. Sienna, who had just exited another private room, approached me with a smile. Speak of the devil. So, Theo was the one who led both teams? The instructor asked multiple times. Yes, if it weren't for him, we would have died long ago. Sienna answered unwaveringly. All right, that's enough for today's interview. May I leave now? I'm rather busy. Upon hearing Sienna's somewhat urgent voice, the instructor nodded. Fine. Creek Sienna immediately left the interview room. This was because her spirit informed her that Theo, who was having a meeting with the senior professor in the next room, had just come out. As the spirit had reported, Theo was outside. Pretending their encounter was a coincidence, Sienna greeted him with a smile. However, Theo's expression did not convey any delight in seeing her. Sienna was not disheartened. After all, he's the hero I've finally found. It wouldn't be enjoyable if it were too easy. Theo was the hero that Sienna had been dreaming of for the past 150 years. As she reminisced about their time in the dungeon, Sienna recalled how calm Theo had been when everyone else was trembling with fear of death. Not only that, he encouraged his teammates to overcome the crisis. He even refused my help. Witnessing his actions, she felt exhilarated. She couldn't help but smile, realizing that she had finally found the hero of her dreams. At that time, Theo was the true hero in every sense. Well, his strength seemed somewhat lacking, but dot. She could help him progress. If he still seemed inadequate after graduating from the academy, she would take him to the Great Forest. In the Great Forest, elves had honed their skills for centuries, presenting an insurmountable challenge for humans. He he dot. Sienna hummed a tune as she looked at Theo. At that moment, she was as elated as the first day she read the Rostos Chronicles. The Rostos Chronicles. It was the novel that strove her to leave the Great Forest. She had read it diligently every day for over ten years, nearly committing the entire content to memory. Although it was a lengthy series, spanning five books, she was an elf. She spent her days immersed in the novel. Before she knew it, Sienna harbored a pure desire to become Leary, the protagonist's aide and female lead in the Rostos Chronicles. Leary had nurtured the protagonist Rostos into the continent's greatest hero. Leary was an elf like her, someone Rostos always relied on and trusted. How did Leary feel? Transforming a boy into a man. A man into the continent's greatest hero. The process of refining a rough gemstone into a polished jewel. How rewarding must that have been? That's why Sienna enrolled in Elinia Academy, known as the Best Hero Academy. Although Leary was a magic aide in the novel, Sienna did not join the magic department. The hero department was the best choice for her to find her own hero. Graduating from the hero department didn't mean she couldn't be an aide. In fact, being in the hero department would make it simpler to monitor every move of the hero she admired. He'd appreciate that, right? Of course, he would. Who wouldn't relish the prospect of becoming the continent's greatest hero? Given enough time, Sienna was confident she could mold him into the greatest hero on the continent. In the midst of these thoughts, an image of a girl suddenly crossed her mind. A young girl who had entered the same dungeon as him, with the same hair and eye color. Her name was Aisha Waldirk. It bothered her how Aisha cozied up to Theo. She's no match for me, of course. Humans lived for only about 100 years, while Sienna was an elf with a lifespan exceeding 1,000 years. There was no way Aisha could compete. After a few decades, Sienna would be the sole companion by his side. She could always request a dragon to prolong his life. He he. The thought of claiming him as her own filled her with excitement. Ah. Uh. As Sienna reveled in these thoughts, Theo suddenly felt a chilling sensation. Chapter ends. CH 37, it's you, 1. Ah, I'm really exhausted. I boarded the carriage bound for the dormitory. It had been a hectic day. See you tomorrow, Theo before parting, Sienna said that with a meaningful smile. How am I supposed to see her? Today's incident was resolved, and tomorrow is supposed to be a break day. Of course, during the break period, Professor Rock, the head professor, suggested students attend lectures from other departments, stating there might be something to learn from them. But it's just a suggestion, not mandatory. In the original work, most students don't bother attending lectures from other departments due to the hero department student's superiority complex. However, I plan to attend a lecture from the night department tomorrow. Aside from the hero department, Elinia Academy houses various departments such as the night department, magic department, alchemy department, exploration department, and management department. Still, the night department suits me best.
It will aid in improving my reputation, and I'll be able to observe the skills of students from other departments. It's a win-win situation, far more productive than merely lying in bed. Additionally, tomorrow, there's a gathering for the gourmet club. Subquest, join at least two clubs and participate actively. Reward, two store gold coins. I can't give up for the sake of the reward. There's a reason I join three clubs instead of two for reputation management purposes. Why? One shouldn't take the quest text in the original work lightly. The stated condition is joining at least two clubs. If I join and participate in three clubs, there should be additional rewards. For instance, let's say there's a quest to hunt 100 cockatrices, and I hunt 200. In that case, the reward isn't just double the stated amount. It's more than that. If the system remains the same as in the original work, I should receive at least three store gold coins as a reward. I still don't understand what it means to participate actively. As long as I attend every gathering, I should meet the basic requirements. Lost in thought, I arrived at the dormitory and immediately climbed the stairs. Welcome back, young master. You've returned early today, Amy greeted me as usual. Yeah, there was a minor incident. Can I ask you to prepare dinner? Of course, young master. Leave it to me. Amy smiled gently. I had always seen her with a stern expression, but lately, her expressions had become more diverse. Just as I was about to enter my room, she asked, young master, was it really just a minor incident? In an instant, Amy's expression hardened. It was merely a swarm of monsters we encountered during the practical evaluation in the magic dungeon. There were no casualties. Is there anything strange about that? No, not at all. I apologize for asking such a needless question. You must be tired, please get some rest. All right, I understand. Bring dinner to my room as before. I wanted to ask why, but Amy's expression was so serious that I decided not to. But what is this uneasy feeling? Did something come from the magic dungeon? Squeak after entering my room, I used magic nullification on myself as an emergency treatment. The thing that was lurking near Theo, no, near young master, it was definitely a spirit. Amy sat at her desk, deep in thought. She had a high affinity with spirits, so she could at least sense what kind of spirit it was. It had been visible in the hallway and even when she brought food to the room. Sometimes spirits cling to humans, but she had never seen it happen before, so it seemed deliberate. It was clear that a spirit mage was targeting young master. Judging by the energy, it was a wind spirit. Then who could it be? A few suspects came to mind. Even in Elinia Academy, where the best talents from the continent gathered, there were very few spirit mages. They were as rare as unicorns. Could it be the wood elf princess of the great forest? Sienna was the first person that came to mind. Furthermore, she was a first-year student in the hero department, just like the young master, making her a prime suspect. Is the Great Forest targeting the young master? The Great Forest, where elves reside, is a powerful entity that even equilibrium cannot disregard. As elves live for over a thousand years, their world is surrounded by forests and trees, offering little entertainment. As a result, most elves devote their time to self-improvement. As a result, each elf warrior was a monster. There was even a recent incident where an equilibrium executive who disappeared after a conflict with an elf warrior. I didn't expect to contact them so soon. Amy picked up a pen and started writing a letter to send to the guild. The following day, Thursday morning, Irene awaited the school carriage at the station. I hope everything is alright. She knew about the incident in the hero department yesterday, where the magic dungeon reportedly malfunctioned. The hero department announced it as such, but rumors suggest that external, and scrupulous forces were involved. It was a relief that no casualties occurred. I hope no one is seriously injured. After all, healers can't treat old wounds. Irene's heart grew heavy. Until the incident is resolved, the hero department is suspending all classes. At least that was a relief. Irene felt irritated for no reason. As his fiancé, shouldn't he at least show his face if he's safe? He was causing her worry. In the northern magic city, they say crystal orbs that enable long-distance communication are sold. She thought she should obtain one. Communication crystal orbs were rumored to be quite expensive. However, she would have an opportunity to acquire one soon, but she'd have a chance to get one soon. It was the third place prize in the martial arts tournament held after the midterm exams during the academy festival. Considering fairness for hero department students, only those ranked 100th or below among the first year students can participate. It's worth a shot. While Irene was lost in her thoughts, creak. The carriage stopped at the station. Come to think of it, she hadn't seen Theo in the carriage recently. In a way, it was a frequent meeting place for them. The brief time they'd spent together felt much longer. As Irene followed the other students onto the carriage, exclamation point. To the right, diagonally behind. 
at the seat she always checked first when boarding the carriage. There was Theo, gazing out the window with a calm expression. Irene hurried over and sat down next to Theo. But what should she say? She sat down, but her mouth wouldn't open. Aren't you hurt anywhere? As a fiancé, shouldn't you at least show your face to your worried fiancé? Or, as he had said before, did you want to see me? Nina said it's good to speak gently to a lover when you meet them after a long time. What's with you? How are you feeling? In the end, her words came out somewhat harsh. Theo, who had been lost in thought looking out the window, turned to Irene after a brief pause. I'm fine. Thanks for your concern, Irene. I'm glad to hear that. It's been a while since I've seen you on the carriage. Why yeah, it has. Irene answered with a stiff nod. After that, she and Theo had an awkward conversation. But it wasn't all bad. Ten minutes felt like one minute. Time flew by so quickly. Attention passengers, the next stop is the night department. I repeat, the next stop is the night department. Please make sure to take your belongings with you when disembarking. Before they knew it, the carriage had arrived at the night department. Ah, stupid, idiot. Irene scolded herself. She hadn't asked Theo why he took the carriage, or where he was going. Asking now would hurt her pride. Now that I think about it, they mentioned that hero department lectures were being substituted with visits to other departments. Naturally, she knew it wasn't mandatory. At that moment, an idea crossed Irene's mind. Could he be coming to the night department? However, the probability was low. She had never seen a hero department student attend a lecture in another department. Higher expectations only led to greater disappointment. Soon, the students started to disembark from the carriage. Regrettably, it was time to part ways. Well, see you later, Theo. I'm going now. As Irene said her farewells and stepped off the carriage, clack, clack. Theo got off with her. Ha! Huh? Irene looked at Theo, her eyes filled with question marks. I'm planning to attend a lecture at the night department today too. If it's all right, let's go together. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Irene couldn't form a coherent sentence in response to the unexpected situation. Theo appeared somewhat gloomy. Do you still find me awkward? No, no, not at all. Let's go together. Finally, Irene cracked a small smile. Chapter ends. CH38, it's you, too. Does it really matter? I walked alongside Irene, who had bowed her head and become docile. She said she was fine, after all. It felt awkward, as I had always walked a few steps apart from Aisha. Come to think of it, had I ever walked alone with a girl like this before? I couldn't remember. It didn't seem like it. Before long, the night department came into view. Unlike the hero department, the night department had nearly a thousand students per grade. Yet, to emphasize the prestige of the hero department at Elinia Academy, the night department's grounds were considerably smaller. The building looked just as I had seen it in the original work. Is it true that the hero department doesn't have class divisions, and everyone attends the same lectures? At some point, Irene had recovered and was looking up at me. Yeah, the night department is divided into five classes, as far as I know. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Chatting like this, Irene and I arrived at the first period classroom. As Irene had mentioned, the night department had distinct classes. Each class held 200 students, from class A to class E. As the top student, Irene was in class A. With a creak, Irene and I entered the classroom. As expected of class A, which was full of the night department's elite, more than half of the seats were already occupied despite the early hour. Exclamation point. All eyes in the classroom were fixed on us. The students stared at Irene and me with astonished expressions. The looks from the female students, in particular, were somehow subtle. Wow. Isn't that Theo Lynn Waldirk? Yeah, you're right. The noble swordsman from the practical evaluation match. Is he the one engaged to Irene? Anyway, it's the first time I've seen someone from the hero department attend a lecture here. The students murmured in hushed voices. How awkward. I would never get used to this. Nonetheless, my body seemed to disagree, as I walked nonchalantly through the countless gazes. I chose a seat in the middle row of the lecture hall and sat next to Irene. Hello, you're Theo, right? A girl sitting to the left of Irene greeted me. She had long, flowing blue hair and orange eyes. Mina. A supporting character who appears as Irene's close friend in most routes. She excels academically and aids Irene, both materially and emotionally. That's right, I'm Theo Lynn Waldirk. You must be Mina. Irene mentioned you. Oh? It seems like you two have been talking quite a bit. By the way, Irene, you didn't badmouth me, did you? Mina playfully shrugged her shoulders. 
No, I wouldn't do that. Irene said you were a good friend. Isn't that right, Irene? Why yes, that's right. Irene nervously replied. Mina glanced at her and snorted before asking me various questions, mostly about my relationship with Irene. I answered within appropriate bounds. When you visited Irene two days ago, it was a huge surprise. The entire night department must be buzzing with rumors about how romantic it was. Ah, I wonder when I'll get a boyfriend who'll surprise me like that. Me Mina. Irene hastily raised her voice, drawing everyone's attention once more. Ugh, I hate it. I patted Irene's shoulder to calm her down. He's not my boyfriend, though. Ah, right, right. Fiancé. I misspoke. I'm sorry, Theo? Yeah. Mina was quite the chatterbox. She must have been like this in the original work, but I hadn't known since her part was limited. Ahem, ahem. At that moment, the authoritative voice of a middle-aged man sounded from the front. The professor had entered through the front door. The imposing professor placed his lecture notes on the podium and began to speak. Let's start the lecture right away. Class president, stand up and greet, the professor's words were cut off. The back door opened, and a student entered. The professor shook his head and, without looking in that direction, continued speaking. It's currently 9.28 a.m., so you're not technically late. However, I explicitly told Class A to arrive at least 10 minutes before the lecture starts. Ah, I'm sorry. I'm Sienna from the Hero Department, here to observe a lecture in the Night Department. It's my first time attending a lecture, so I didn't know about that rule in Class A. Please let it slide just this once dot. It was Sienna. She was smiling brightly. Her audacious cheerfulness made the professor falter. Fine. Just take your seat quickly. Thank you dot. Sienna glanced around the room. And then. He he, she sat down next to me. Irene was in a foul mood. Sienna kept hovering around Theo, which irked her to no end. Theo, what does this mean? Sienna asked innocently. I'm not quite sure, he replied, puzzled. At first, Theo had tried to maintain his distance from the chatty Sienna, a commendable stance for an engaged man. However, Sienna seemed to not notice. Ah, I think I understand now. So, Theo, should I interpret it like this? She asked, her eyes narrowing. I'm still not certain, he admitted. Didn't we cover this in our introduction to hero studies? I remember you answering the professor's question correctly. Are you dash Sienna narrowed her eyes. Are you really listening to me? I, I am sorry, I must have misheard you, Theo stammered, a rare sight. Irene felt a pang of jealousy, her lips tightening into a thin line. Theo cursed under his breath. He had suspected Sienna would be persistent ever since she followed him to the night department, but he hadn't expected her to be so relentless. She was like a bulldozer, demolishing any walls he tried to erect. Her fierce determination was honestly, quite terrifying. Though her nature was inherently kind, her emotional swings were unpredictable. She must have discovered I'm in the night department and attached a spirit to me, how do I shake her off? Theo maintained a neutral expression as he pondered. A simple refusal wouldn't resolve the issue, Sienna seemed to possess a strong sense of ownership over him. Fortunately, she doesn't seem to be in a rush. I'll pretend to play along while I devise another plan. Meanwhile, Theo found himself in an enviable position, flanked by two beautiful women, Irene on his left and Sienna on his right. Their presence drew the gazes of their classmates. If the students in the front row are casting glances at us, those in the back must be staring non-stop, he mused. Once again, Theo found himself grateful for his, twisted noble's dignity, trait. Without it, he would be shifting uncomfortably in his seat, beads of sweat forming on his brow. Sienna narrowed her eyes. Irene was still in a sour mood. Throughout the morning, Sienna had persistently clung to Theo, even joining them for lunch. Theo, Sienna, Irene, and Mina, a peculiar mix of two students from the hero department and two from the night department. Irene didn't care for this group dynamic. Yet, she couldn't think of a way to separate Sienna from Theo. Not only in the classroom, but also in the cafeteria, all eyes were on their group. If she raised her voice even slightly, unfavorable rumors would spread throughout the academy in an instant. Moreover, Sienna was a princess of the great forest wood elves, an esteemed figure. She must know that Theo is my fiancé. Such behavior implied that she must have some sort of trust in something. She must have found some weakness. Although Irene thought so, her emotions were currently in a turbulent state, and dark thoughts continued to plague her. Mina's words echoed in her mind, men can't resist women who come onto them. They can't help it. That's just how they're born. Of course, Irene knew that Theo loved her. However, no matter how much he did, if such a beautiful woman kept pursuing him, his heart would surely waver. Could it be? 
If, by a one in a million chance, Theo were to accept the annoying elf princess as his wife, what would she do? She couldn't say there was no possibility. Theo was the heir to a high-ranking noble family whose influence spanned the entire continent. It wouldn't be strange for him to have multiple wives. In fact, it would be expected. The Waldirk family would likely welcome the opportunity to forge ties with the Great Forest. As Irene wallowed in her agonizing thoughts, Sienna was attempting to feed Theo. Come on, Theo. Say ah, Irene's expression hardened in an instant. No, it's fine. I can eat on my own. Theo refused. Good job, Theo. Irene clenched her fists. As Theo continued to refuse, Sienna narrowed her eyes. Ah, open your mouth. Al. Right. Theo accepted the food Sienna offered. Hee hee, wasn't that nice? Sienna wore a satisfied smile. WH what are you doing right now? Irene's rationality had flown out the window. Chapter ends. CH39, it's you, 3. Irene's voice rose sharply as she stood up from her seat. Question mark. In that instant, the eyes of everyone in the student cafeteria turned toward her. The few model students, annoyed that their peaceful lunch had been disturbed, furrowed their brows. Irene drew surprised gazes from the people around her, her expression contradicting the nickname cold-blooded knight she was known for. Even a male student gaped at Theo with envious eyes. Amidst the myriad of gazes, Irene realized she had impulsively raised her voice. I've made a scene in front of all these people. Meanwhile, Sienna smirked and regarded Irene with an air of amusement. Nina grabbed Irene's sleeve. Irene looked down at her. Irene. Nina spoke quietly, shaking her head. Please restrain yourself. Showing such anxiety in a crowded place like the student cafeteria only makes the elf more delighted. Nina thought to herself, but Irene's unease remained. Still standing, Irene fixed her gaze upon Theo. To those unfamiliar with him, his expression appeared no different than usual. But I can tell. He seemed saddened about something. She didn't know what it was yet, but it was clear that the golden-haired elf had a hold on him. I promise I'll save you, Theo. Irene bit her lip firmly and made a vow. Theo opened his mouth. Irene. Sit down. All right. Only then did Irene return to her seat. Before long, she had reverted to her usual cold-blooded knight demeanor. A long silence hung over the table. When the other students in the cafeteria lost interest and looked away, Irene turned her gaze toward Sienna. Sienna, it's highly unbecoming to behave as you did earlier in front of so many people. Theo is the heir of the prestigious Waldirk family. We must maintain his dignity. Even if you've spent a long time in the deep forest and are unaware of how the outside world works, haven't you crossed a line? Hee <laughs> hee, I'm well aware of how the outside world works. I'm royalty, after all. Besides, why should I be concerned about those around me? I'm not doing this to just anyone. Can't I do this much for someone I love? Sienna continued to wear a leisurely smile. Irene suppressed her annoyance. Do you know that Theo and I are engaged? It's indecent to say such things in front of one's fiancé. Hee <laughs> hee, of course I know. But it's a political marriage, isn't it? You're not even married yet. Moreover, I know full well how much the Waldirk family desires an alliance with our great forest. With her composure unbroken, Sienna had countered with an underhanded fact. Irene was at a loss for words. So that's how you want to play this. A formidable opponent, indeed. She was so brazen. After clenching her fists and thinking for a moment, Irene spoke calmly. Fine, Sienna. But this is the night department's student cafeteria. It's a public place, so please show some restraint. Hee hee, all right. Sienna smiled slyly. Nina looked at Irene with a sympathetic gaze. After lunchtime, the night department began their afternoon practical sparring session. Similar to the hero department, students could pair up with whomever they wished to spar. Of course, since Sienna and I were observing the classes, we were also allowed to spar with the night department students. I looked around with the practice longsword at my waist, scanning the area. I should observe as many techniques as possible. Having seen nearly all of Irene's techniques, it seemed best to observe those of an entirely new character. Surely, in this vast night department, there would be someone utilizing a useful weapon technique. In the original work Karenzina Chronicles, a character's importance was not determined solely by their prowess in battle. Occasionally, there were strong characters like Nocter who had little presence in the original work. Of course, most of the main characters are quite powerful. I hadn't yet noticed any eye-catching students. While I continued to search, a male student approached me. Hero Department. Let's have a match. He challenged me to a duel. He was tall, with a decent build and looked like he could put up a fight. He had been staring at me intently since morning. 
All right. I gripped my practice longsword, and my opponent picked up his practice spear. My name is Theo Lin Waldirk. What's yours? Maxim. Introducing himself as Maxim, the male student glared at me. Maxim. The name rang a bell. In this story, Maxim paled in comparison to Theo, having the presence of nothing more than a minor extra. Considering the total playtime of the original work was nearly 20,000 hours, it was impressive that I could remember him at all. Anyway, I don't have much information about him. Maxim was just a pitiful fellow who was rejected by Irene after confessing to her in every route. His preferences and primary techniques remained unknown. He must have impulsively challenged me because I was Irene's fiancé. Name, Maxim Markin, gender, male age, 16 race, human affiliation, Elinia Academy, night department strength, 9 stamina, 9 mana, 6 tenacity, 7 traits, spear expert, passive effect, view details, throwing expert, passive effect, view details, fighting spirit, passive effect, view details. However, I had his status window. Judging by his stats and traits, he's not an ordinary extra. Irene, the top student, had strength and stamina of 10 each, while Maxim had 9. The students of the night department say class were certainly something else. Nevertheless, he was a worthy opponent. Having honed my natural power and various techniques, I had a good chance of winning. Losing never crossed my mind. I didn't want to experience the powerlessness I felt when Peel defeated me. If necessary, I'll use overload. Before long, all the students stopped their sparring and stared at Maxim and me. The supervising professor, seemingly intrigued, crossed his arms and focused on our impending duel. I'll go first. Hero Department Surveying the surroundings, Maxim lowered his upper body and thrust his spear towards my face, a blatantly insulting gesture. Fine, I'll give you the first strike. Feeling quite irritated, I snapped my fingers at him, an equally insulting gesture. I'll teach him a lesson. This would be my first time actually facing a spearman. Still, I had seen plenty of them during the practical evaluations. The most popular weapon in this world is the spear, after all. Don't mess around. With that, the excited Maxim charged at me with his spear, true to the fighting spirit trait he possessed. However, I could clearly see his movements. Whoosh! I easily dodged Maxim's thrust and immediately closed the gap between us. A battle between a spear and a sword favored the spear user, as the reach difference usually meant that the spear users would win 9 times out of 10. The most effective strategy against a spear users was to close the distance. Of course, spear users knew this and typically had countermeasures in place. Not much of a challenge. But that only applied when their opponents couldn't read their movements. Thanks to my observer's eye, I could clearly see Maxim's blind spots. Thud. After closing in, I swiftly struck Maxim's abdomen. Ugh, Maxim doubled over with a single scream of pain. Clutching his stomach, Maxim refused to accept reality. How could there be such a gap between us? Two weeks ago, Theo's performance at the Dome Stadium flashed through Maxim's mind. At that time, Maxim had fervently wished for Theo to be struck down. The reason was simple, jealousy consumed him. Irene had rejected Maxim's confession outright, and today, he had clearly seen her looking at Theo with admiration in her eyes. Damn it. Anger boiled within him, and he couldn't concentrate on the morning lectures. Two weeks had been more than enough time for a passionate teenage boy to forget the past. That's why he had planned to provoke Theo with a duel. Maxim hadn't planned to win from the start. His goal was a draw. It would be humiliating enough for a student from the hero department to tie with a student from the night department. There was a possibility of victory. Theo's main weapon was a long sword, while Maxim's was a spear, a distinct advantage in compatibility. Ah, uh, ugh, Maxim retched, clutching his stomach. Fortunately, he had eaten a small lunch, otherwise, he would have disgracefully vomited all over the place. Ha, ha. Maxim gasped for breath, lifting his head to gaze at Theo. However, Theo's expression was as indifferent as before the duel, displaying no sign of joy in his victory. Did he never even consider the possibility of losing to me? It was devastating. To Theo, defeating Maxim was probably akin to breaking a mere toy. As Maxim's body trembled with shame, his classmates swarmed around Theo. Will you duel me next, Theo? I want to go first. Ah, uh, please. It's always been my dream to face someone from the hero department. Not a single person showed any interest in Maxim. The students of the night department were no fools, they all knew that Maxim's challenge had been anything but pure. To them, Maxim had become a disgrace, a blight on their sacred duels. Maxim sniffled as he stood up. With his head bowed, he moved desolately to a corner of the room. Chapter ends. CH40, it's you, 4. Phew. I took a deep breath. Ah, I lost. The night department student I just faced clutched his left thigh as he spoke. It was a good match. He was the fifth one. 
I had definitely become stronger. All five of them were in the lowest ranks of the hero department in terms of strength, from 181st to 200th place. Just last Monday, during the practical dueling session, I couldn't even touch Peel's clothing and had been consumed with self-loathing. Now, none of these students could even graze mine. It was as if I had become Peel. Basking momentarily in the afterglow of victory, a girl approached me for another duel. Is it my turn now? Hee <laughs> hee, I'm looking forward to it. Contrary to her pretty face, she was as tall and imposing as any man. It was Julia. Yay, finally I get to face someone from the hero department. I was so upset that I couldn't participate in the first semester martial arts tournament. Hee <laughs> hee. Julia genuinely sounded excited. As befitting a game designed for men, Karen Zena Chronicles had many named female characters. Julia was one of the three named characters in the first year night department, even more formidable than Irene in terms of strength. At this point in time, she was the only one in the night department with the weapon master trait. Had she been a little smarter, she would have been a top contender even in the hero department. I stared at Julia with a wary gaze. Truth be told, I was quite exhausted from facing five students one after another without any break. Should I use overload? I probably couldn't win if I used it in 10 second bursts. Could I win if I filled it to the brim and used it to its limit? Theo has reached his limit Irene thought to herself. Though Theo appeared calm on the outside, she knew he was struggling within. And having defeated five opponents in a row, he had done enough. At the moment, Theo cannot win against Julia. There was not only a difference in their basic skills, but Theo was also exhausted. Julia was stronger than Irene in terms of brute force. The only reason Irene held the top spot was due to her mastery of theory. If they were ranked purely on combat prowess, Julia would be the first. Irene knew this fact all too well. Julia was a fierce warrior who had survived the harsh plains where conflicts between tribes frequently erupted. At 18 years old, she was two years older than both Theo and Irene, and thus had more real-life combat experience. Just as Irene was about to step forward, another girl beat her to it. How about you face me? I'm also in the hero department, Sienna said, a playful smile gracing her lips. Julia glanced at Sienna and nodded her head. All right, I prefer a fresh opponent over a weary one anyway. Julia spun her primary weapon, a long spear, around. What weapon should I face you with? Sienna asked. Your best one. I know you as a spirit wizard, though. Will that do? Julia naturally spoke informally. Of course, students in the academy usually spoke informally to one another regardless of department. However, Sienna was often treated as an exception. Although she appeared to be in her late teens, no student in the academy was unaware that Sienna was an elf who had lived for over 150 years. The professors maintained informal speech due to appearances. He he. Sienna's expression hardened for a moment, but Theo did not miss the brief change. It must be because it's Julia. In the original work, thanks to her rugged appearance and hot-tempered personality, Julia was dubbed the female barbarian by the players. Moreover, she was relatively older for a first-year student at 18. Regaining her composure, Sienna grabbed a practice rapier from the weapon rack. She's indeed angry. The rapier was Sienna's primary weapon. Elves primarily wield rapiers and long swords as their main weapons, offering a high level of mobility. Of course, facing long-reach weapons such as spears or polearms with a sword can be challenging. However, for elves, that isn't much of a problem as they can simply overcome it with their exceptional skills. A human wielding a sword might, at best, have 30 or 40 years before they become frail with a short prime. On the other hand, elves enjoy a prime lasting at least 8 or 900 years. They maintain their youthful bodies until death approaches. In close combat, elves are practically akin to reapers. Swish, swish, dash. Sienna demonstrated her skill with the rapier, swinging it gracefully. Shall we begin? she asked. Sure, Julia agreed. Julia took her stance, holding her spear. Her posture seemed full of openings, yet it was impossible to tell where to strike. It was a form optimized from her extensive combat experience. Sienna also held her rapier, assuming a graceful and elegant stance. They're really serious, Theo thought. He recognized that stance. It was one adopted by many elven swordsmen in the original work. But what's your name? We should at least know our opponent's name, since it's a duel. A duel, such a pleasant word. I am Julia. I see, Julia. For a moment, Sienna's eyes sharpened. You see, she said, her voice suddenly cold and different. Julia's eyes widened at the change in Sienna's aura. Why are you so curt? At that moment, Sienna charged forward. The match was entirely one-sided. Sienna was the undisputed victor. Though I had anticipated her victory, it was far more overwhelming than I had imagined. I lost. 
Why? How on earth, why? Julia knelt on the ground, her eyes filled with disbelief as she stared at the dirt beneath her. Wow. It had been that one-sided. Sienna had effortlessly dodged all of Julia's heavy attacks, focusing only on striking her legs. Naturally, the battle-savvy Julia defended her legs. However, despite other areas being wide open, Sienna continued to target only her legs. It was as if she was toying with her. I feel like I've seen this scene before. Had I appeared this way when I had dueled with Peel? Like me, Julia couldn't even graze Sienna's clothes. Julia fell countless times and got up just as many. The course of the duel was strikingly similar to my own experience, being knocked down within three hits. Fear washed over me, to think she'd show no mercy and beat her like that just because she used informal speech. Should I start using formal speech now? The thought crossed my mind in all seriousness. In any case, the Karenzina Chronicles proved once again that stats and traits were not everything. Julia had five expert level traits in addition to Weapon Master. Sienna, on the other hand, had only Weapon Expert for close combat. Based on stats and traits alone, Julia should have been the overwhelming victor, but the result was the exact opposite. Even if Sienna had discreetly received help from the spirits, it was still a shocking outcome. You still need more training, but it was an enjoyable duel after such a long time, Sienna told Julia before turning around. Theo! She dashed over and pulled me into a tight embrace. Did I do well? He he. Like a puppy seeking praise, Sienna gazed up at me. We were too close. Sienna was tall, so the distance between our faces was barely five centimeters. I could hear her racing heartbeat. Ah, ah. I could feel her excited breath. There was a faint, warm scent too. Her beauty was unparalleled in this world, and it was too overwhelming to meet her gaze. Moreover, something soft pressed against me, and it was terribly distracting. Why yeah, you did well, I said, turning my head away. Before I knew it, the practical evaluation had come to an end. Julia still seemed to be in shock, showing no sign of getting up. Let's go, Theo. The next lecture is quite far from here, Irene, who had been glaring at me for some time, said. All right. See Sienna, let go of me now. Hee hee, all right. It's just that you smell so nice, Theo. Sienna, who had clung to me for quite a while, finally released her grasp. I don't know how many times I recited the national anthem in my head to calm my nerves. I took a moment to look around. Wait just a moment. Julia still knelt on the ground, seemingly unable to get up. With her physical abilities, she should have been able to stand by now. She must be deeply shocked. Feeling a sense of empathy, I approached Julia and extended my hand. Stand up. You're the one from the hero department? Julia asked, her eyes widening as she looked up at me. Yes. A true warrior is one who overcomes despair, not one has who never known defeat. It was something I had heard from Nocter before. I hoped it would console her. Julia stared at me for a moment before taking my hand. I could feel the rough texture of her palm, a testament to countless hours of training. Thank you, Hero Department. My name isn't Hero Department, it's Theo. All right, Theo. Thank you. You're truly a heroic man, contrary to the rumors. I'll be sure to repay this debt. With that, Julia smiled. She had returned to her true self, the lively barbarian woman. Chapter ends. CH 41, it's you, 5. Thursday, 4.30 p.m. All the lectures in the night department had concluded. I had observed various techniques in the practical classes and wanted to master them as soon as possible. My body felt restless. I need to hurry to the training ground. I said my farewells to Irene and Mina. I'll be going now. Take care, Irene and Mina. Since I didn't have any belongings with me, I felt light. As I was about to leave the night department, Irene spoke up. Theo, let's train together. Sure, I plan to go to the hero department's training ground for a practice session, though. I already knew the techniques, so it would be more efficient to improve my proficiency against magic dolls. In other words, I didn't need Irene's help. Moreover, there was a high probability that Noctur would be at the training ground, so I wanted to build up my stamina with him as well. I see. Irene sounded somewhat sullen. Then, Mina chimed in. Why don't you just go to the hero department's training ground together? I think even first years can bring one person with them, Irene silently rejoiced. Well done, Mina. Although the hero department's training ground was exclusive to hero department students, students from other departments could bring one person with them. From the second year, when the formation of aides becomes more formalized, up to four people can be brought in. Of course, Irene knew this too. However, it was too humiliating for her to say it herself. Irene hurriedly spoke up. Th that's right. 
Actually, I've always wanted to experience the hero department's training ground. I'm curious to see how effective my swordsmanship will be against magic dolls. She had a feeling that now was the time to push forward. Theo nodded slightly. Hmm, I see. Irene, if you're okay with it, let's go together. Oh, okay. Shall we go? As she said that, Irene stuck close to Theo, just a hair's breadth away. Just a little movement, and their hands would touch. Although the elf had unabashedly hugged him in public, Irene couldn't bring herself to do the same. Hmm, I guess I'll go too. Sienna casually looped her arm around Theo's. Ah, ah, ah. She should have mustered up the courage, there weren't many onlookers anyway. Irene wished she had been more assertive. Irene, Sienna, and I boarded the carriage bound for the hero department. The interior was quiet. Well, who would go to the hero department at this time? Despite the tranquility, I felt suffocated. Our Theo, you're so diligent. It's nice to see, you know? I'm pretty skilled with a longsword too. Want me to teach you a bit? That's my role, Sienna. I've been Theo's dedicated teacher for quite some time. Ignoring the numerous empty seats, Irene and Sienna sat on either side of me. Fortunately, I had escaped from Sienna's embrace, but the mere contact of our arms and shoulders was still uncomfortable. Just by her appearance, she seems like a mere child. Of course, I don't dislike it, but I'm not ready to open my heart to others yet. I felt much stronger today, but I'm still a failure. I don't know when I might die, so forming close relationships with others is frightening. To be honest, especially with Irene. As long as I don't make any grave mistakes, I probably won't die around her. At least, she doesn't seem to dislike me. The biggest problem is Sienna. I can't keep playing along with her indefinitely. Of course, I'm grateful that she readily defended me and defeated the female barbarian, Julia, when I was in trouble, and her hug wasn't bad. However, our relationship is too one-sided. I have to figure out a way to handle this. At least, I should prevent her from stalking me. As I pondered various things, we arrived in front of the female dormitory. Sienna grinned and spoke to me. I'll head back to the dormitory now. The training ground is sweaty and not so great. Of course, Theo, even your sweat smells fragrant. Dot. With that said, Sienna stood up from her seat. Today was really enjoyable, right? See you tomorrow, hee hee. She winked at me and disembarked the carriage. Does that mean she'll come again tomorrow? Sigh. It's fine when no one is around, but I hope she doesn't hug me or feed me in crowded places. Irene and I headed straight to the hero department's training ground. Thud. I opened the large door to the training ground. To access the mock training ground where you can spar with magic dolls, you have to go through the dueling arena. When we arrived at the dueling arena, I saw some familiar faces. Wow, Nocturne. That was really sharp. You have great strength and stamina, so it would be good to gather a more diverse skill set. All right. Then try this, Neek. There he goes again. In order, there were Neek, Nocturne, and Peel. Neek and Peel are training partners, but Nocturne's presence is unexpected. Hey, Theo. From the spectator seats of the dueling arena, our orc classmates, who had been watching Neek and Nocturne's duel, greeted me. Did you come to train? Yeah, I came for some mock training. Who's the girl next to you? I've never seen her before. She's my fiancé. No wonder something's different. Then, the orc classmates lost interest in us and continued watching Neek and Nocturne's duel. As expected of orcs. Orcs have little interest in the females of other races. They believe a beauty must be large and muscular. The only reason they mentioned Irene, who's next to me, is because she's with me. They would probably only show interest for a moment if it were a muscular female barbarian like Julia. As Irene and I were about to head to the mock training ground, hey! Peel approached me and spoke. Why? Your fiancé? Yes, her name is Irene. She's pretty. Then Peel averted her gaze. Why is she like that? In any case, it would be awkward to greet Neek and Nocturne since they are in the middle of a match. Irene and I arrived at the spacious training ground, large enough for ten people to run around freely. What type of opponent would you like to face, Irene? We can alter the surrounding environment and set the opponent's weapons and approximate strength. An elf primarily using a rapier. Strength and stamina stats should be around ten. Set the terrain to resemble a dome stadium. Irene responded without any hesitation. Dot. The opponent Irene described was undoubtedly Sienna. Understood. For my opponent, I selected a female barbarian wielding a long spear, Julia. Let's give it a try. The settings have been completed. Please say yes when you're ready. Yes, the mock training session proved to be quite beneficial. It was far superior to practicing through visualization. 
Although the magic dolls fell short compared to real opponents, I could feel my skills and experience improving. Indeed, the training in the hero department is on another level. Irene seemed satisfied as well, wiping her sweat and smiling. We completed our mock training and stepped outside. A considerable amount of time had passed, and now the orcs and lizardmen were competing. Neek, Peel, Nocter, and other orcs were observing their match from the audience seats. I turned to Irene. I'm thinking of doing some physical training. What about you, Irene? Since we're here, I'd like to join as well. All right, let's go together for a bit. I approached Nocter in the audience seats. You seem busy, Nocter. No, I was just about to finish up and go do some physical training. It's perfect timing then. How about we train together for a change? I'd love that. Let's see how much you've improved. I hope you haven't been neglecting your training just because we haven't been training together recently. With that, Nocter stood up. Of course, I've been gaining even more valuable experience than just physical training. Great, great. By the way, I haven't seen this friend before. She doesn't seem to be from the hero department. You really are a true warrior, Theo. Nocter glanced at Irene, who was standing next to me. Why is that? I felt a sense of unease creeping in. A true warrior never turns away a woman who comes to him. The friend with the bow who used to follow you around was the same. Oh, and just so you know, I also had a line of great women back in my hometown. It seems like we are quite similar, Theo. Nocter chuckled heartily, showing his teeth. So there's another woman besides the elf. Irene's voice was cold. It seemed like she was misunderstanding something. I glared at Nocter. All right, all right, anyway, I'll go ahead to the training ground. You two take your time talking. Nocter nonchalantly laughed, then gave me a thumbs up before leaving the arena. Irene let out a deep sigh. Ah, my life is over. Chapter ends. CH42, see you on Friday, 1. Traits can be acquired randomly, but they may also be obtained through diligent training. In both cases, the probability of gaining one is quite low. Even among the most talented students in the hero department, only about 1 in 50 may acquire a useful trait in a year. Setting aside traits that appear by chance, others are gained through training. The exact process of obtaining these remains unclear. However, a credible hypothesis exists. It is believed that traits are obtained after reaching a certain level of understanding through repetitive practice. Cases of gaining traits like observer's eye were more common among people who constantly observed others, while traits like sage's brain primarily manifested in professors or postgraduate students in labs, supporting this hypothesis. Moreover, possessing a good trait in Karen Zena Chronicles doesn't guarantee absolute strength. People with user-level traits could defeat those with expert-level traits, and sometimes, those with expert-level traits could overcome individuals with master-level traits. However, based on the rank of a trait, one can generally gauge strength and potential. While not all students at top universities are necessarily intelligent, they tend to possess a high potential for intelligence. The following day, Friday, I headed to the hero department instead of the night department. I observed the students' skills during the practical evaluations, and I was already familiar with the theory lectures. Of course, if I attended again today, I would see even more diverse techniques, but the efficiency would be much lower compared to yesterday. It would be better to familiarize myself with the techniques I witnessed yesterday. I should visit Mari's office today. Mari's ongoing research was challenging for her to complete alone. There was a high probability that she desperately needed my assistance. Our meeting back then must have touched her heartstrings. The timing seemed fitting. As soon as I arrived at the practice arena, I set up a mock battle. Naturally, I didn't use overload, but yesterday, I had been significantly pressured by a magic doll modeled after Julia. My goal for today was to hold my own against it. Some time has passed since I began the mock battle. I was deeply immersed, I barely felt the passage of time. Phew my entire body was drenched in sweat but, it didn't feel bad. That state of immersion is a delightful experience. After sparring multiple times against the same opponent, I started to get a feel for how to handle them. Of course, if it were the real Julia instead of the magic doll, I would have been knocked out long ago. Wiping my sweat with the towel I had brought, I took a brief break. A new trait has been acquired. Oh. Finally, my training paid off. Gaining a new trait is always thrilling. When I played Karen Zena Chronicles, the character Neek, whom the user controlled, occasionally acquired new traits. Of course, he didn't obtain any useful traits. Neek was a protagonist wrapped in master-level traits from the start. The most useful trait he ever acquired was, Merchant's Eye, obtained after appraising various items during the merchant route. The trait I obtained now was, Sword Beginner. This trait, worth about 5 gold coins in the marketplace, is the lowest-ranking sword-related trait. However, the important thing is that I acquired it after birth. And the fact that all the training I've done so far hasn't vanished, 
but remains within my body, is crucial. Even the lowest ranked trait is advantageous compared to having none. If I diligently train, I may be able to evolve this sword beginner trait into higher ranked traits, sword user, sword expert, sword master. For example, Irene's, sword expert, trait will change to, sword master, as the story progresses. Either way, it's a significant windfall. I had been expecting little from Theo due to his incompetence, so this is an impressive harvest. At this rate, I might be able to compete with the likes of Neek and Peel, perhaps? Grinning, I left the practice arena. Phew. Outside the arena lay the dueling ground, an oval-shaped stadium. Peel stood there with her eyes closed, gently moving her practice rapier. What kind of training method is that? Is she battling her inner self? Well, it's not my concern. I should do some stamina training. As I contemplated that and walked toward the exit of the dueling ground, hey! I heard Peel's voice from behind. What? Are you busy? No. Let's duel. Peel bluntly challenged me to a duel. She's truly fixated on dueling. I'm still scarred emotionally from being defeated so mercilessly. Why does she want to beat me again? Of course, I'm different now. All right, it's an excellent opportunity to test my newly acquired trait, Sword Beginner. Besides, I watched Irene fight against a magic puppet based on Sienna yesterday. Irene's primary weapon is a long sword, Sienna's a rapier. My main weapon is a long sword, and Peel's is a rapier. The situation aligns perfectly. I've even got a dedicated trait now. I should at least graze her. I stood opposite Peel, wielding a practice longsword. Our eyes met. She wore a faint smile. That's psycho. It's said that experts can discern their opponent's emotions just by looking into their eyes. Those eyes signaled for me to make the first move. This is going to hurt. I immediately charged at her. Damn. As expected, there's no answer. Just like on Monday, I became a punching bag. I got up nine times and continued charging at her, but I still couldn't even brush against Peel's clothes. How is she this skilled at this age? Did she train in a time chamber or something? Phew. Lying on the ground, I exhaled a long sigh. I lack the energy to attempt another try. For now, Peel remains an insurmountable obstacle. Yet. I've made progress. On Monday, I hadn't managed to surpass three hits, but today, without using overload, I achieved four. I even caught a glimpse of techniques she hadn't used last time. This is enough for me. Hey, you, Peel said, looking down at me. What? During Wednesday's magic dungeon incident, you were the leader, right? Yes, that's correct. So, the rumors have spread in just one day. My spirits lifted. I can practically hear the sound of my reputation rising. How did you manage that? It's simple. In an emergency, someone had to leave the group, and I happen to be the most suitable person for the job. You're unlucky. Get up now. You've rested enough. Peel pointed her practice sword at me. Has this dual obsessed individual lost her sanity? I'm on the brink of collapse. I'm no monster like her and Neek. Let's call it a day. I have other plans. Saying that, I stood up and brushed the dirt off. Peel narrowed her eyes. What are you up to? It's personal. With that, I walked toward the training hall exit. She must have vented her stress by now, so she won't suddenly attack me from behind, right? Peel's questioning gaze followed me, but I did my best to ignore it and left the training hall. The current time is 11 a.m., an awkward time to eat. In other words, perfect timing. After leaving the training hall, I headed straight to Professor Mari's office. Knock knock I knocked on the office door. I heard a voice inviting me in, so I opened the door and entered. As before, I found Mari engulfed by a stack of books. She greeted me with a smile. Welcome, Theo. No, Theo Lynn Waldirk. Today, she looked different. Mari wasn't in her usual casual attire, instead, she was dressed up. She wore a white shirt that accentuated her curvy figure and a tight skirt. Beneath the skirt were legs clad in coffee-colored stockings, and her face displayed carefully applied makeup. That's the same outfit she wore during the practical evaluation explanation. Was she going somewhere? Regardless, the fact that Mari called me by my full name, not as a student, meant. Nice to see you, Mari Jane. It was a sign that she wanted to talk as equals, not as a student and professor. She was quite a clever woman. Take a seat anywhere you feel comfortable. After sitting on a sofa, I asked, any progress in your research? There's been some progress, but, no breakthroughs. Let's have some tea and talk. What kind of tea would you like? Mari got up and walked over to a magical induction device. I'll leave it up to you. Just not mint tea. All right. 
Just wait a moment. Dot. Soon, Mari made me a mint chocolate latte. Dot. I really hated it. Chapter ends. CH43, see you on Friday, too. Try this, Theo. It's from a famous dessert shop. I'm not thirsty. But it's really delicious. Mari, looking a bit sullen, took a sip of her mint chocolate latte and picked up a piece of chocolate to eat. Eating sweets helps clear the mind, you know. You should try it too. I got this as a special gift from the shop owner I know. Even if customers are willing to pay any amount, they only sell a limited quantity. Of course, I can understand that, but this isn't the right time. My appetite has vanished. I'm fine, thank you. All right. After Mari's weak reply, silence filled the faculty room. It was so quiet. I'm sorry, but... I know it's impolite to keep rejecting someone's goodwill. But if it's not right, it's not right. I reminded myself of my original goal. I came here to help with Mari's research and to repay her for the debt I owe her. Breaking the long silence, I spoke up. Anyway, I was wondering if you were too busy to have me visit. Well, I'm not that busy yet. Do I look busy? You're dressed as if you're going to a formal event today. I refrained from making potentially rude comments, like it seems she put a lot of effort into her makeup. I believe that it's good to have some boundaries even with people you consider on your side. Mari shrugged her shoulders. It's not a particularly formal event, just a gathering at the Hero Association. People argue noisily about who's right and who's wrong. Ah, just thinking about it gives me a headache. Should I just not go? No, if it's an association gathering, you should attend. You must be busy, so let's get straight to the point. Tell me how far your research has progressed. Oh, so this is how it works. I just need to apply it like this, right, Theo? Mari's eyes widened as she looked at me. Yes, you understand quickly, Mari. As I said earlier, unless the leader of the group is at the highest level, this method is guaranteed to work. After most of the monsters are wiped out this way, only a small number of people need to be sent in to complete the mission. Ah, uh, I see. Mari nodded repeatedly. She's not the youngest professor in the hero department for nothing. Mari was smarter than I thought. I was prepared to explain for two hours, but she understood most of what I said in less than 30 minutes. Wow. I never thought about it like this. Why didn't I come up with this idea? Her light green eyes were filled with admiration as she looked at me. Maybe it's because you've been researching alone all this time. It seems like you couldn't share your findings with other professors. That's true. Since you seem to understand up to this point, I'll talk about the situation after the small group is sent in. I continued my explanation. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Wow, it fits perfectly. Even those who barely do anything in the association wouldn't know about this. By now, Mari was nodding not just with her head but with her entire upper body. But it's so distracting. As her upper body moved, her ample chest swayed as well. Her tight shirt couldn't contain it. The faint outline of her impressive, deep and white valley was visible. I couldn't take my eyes off it. Damn it. I felt a sense of guilt. I understand that I'm at an age where such desires are normal. But even if it's a physiological phenomenon, I'm not a monster. I can't believe I couldn't control even this small desire at such a crucial moment. It seemed like Mari hadn't noticed my lewd gaze. Honestly, I can't think rationally when it comes to matters of the opposite sex. She shouldn't know. If she finds out, I'll die of embarrassment. Ho oh, ooh. It's all because of Sienna. If someone who doesn't know my reputation asks when I became such a lustful person, I would answer it started when Sienna hugged me yesterday. That obscene elf seemed to have dragged out the lust that was deep inside my heart. I could almost hear her giggling in my ears. I recited the national anthem in my head at 16 times the speed. Splendid rivers and mountains. Ah, damn it. Because I recited it too quickly, my inner thoughts slipped out. Mari tilted her head and leaned forward to look at me. Um, Theo? Why are you suddenly like that? I'm following along well, there's no need for you to be considerate. Ah, I'm sorry. I was just thinking about the next part of the explanation. I slowly backed away. We were too close. I can't embarrass myself anymore. If I make another mistake, I'd rather bite my tongue and die. With that thought in mind, I spoke. I will explain the next part. After finishing the discussion with Theo, Mari headed to the association's branch office in the kingdom's capital. Though she had casually mentioned it to Theo earlier, today's gathering was quite an important event. Mari, a hero of commoner origin, was in her late twenties, but she had already distinguished herself in the association where numerous heroes were affiliated. As a result, she had received a lot of pushback from the noble-born heroes. Those fools who can only rely on their family names. However, Mari's mood was cheerful, 
thanks to the explanation Theo had practically hammered into her head. I can't believe he's the same kid from last semester. How could he come up with such an idea? When she first heard Theo's explanation, she felt as if she had been hit in the head with a hammer. He had suggested something that even the well-established heroes in the association hadn't thought of. With this, she would be able to deal a significant blow to the noble-born heroes who endlessly tried to suppress her. He 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 dot. Humming a happy tune, Mari boarded the academy-bound carriage. On another note, he's unexpectedly cute in some ways. Mari recalled Theo's appearance in the faculty office. He kept glancing at her body. He probably thought she hadn't noticed, but he couldn't evade her intuition. He would suddenly stop while explaining things well, and when she approached him, he would hurriedly back away. A cute child deserves a reward. Mari giggled. After having lunch, I headed to the training ground. Since club meetings were cancelled yesterday and today, there was nothing else to do. Having done plenty of mock training and duels in the morning, I decided to go to the gym. Squeak I promptly pushed the entrance door open. There were about ten people in the gym. All of them familiar faces, Neek, Peel, Ishild, Max, Aisha, even the mage, Andrew, was there. Obviously, stalking her. What kind of gym workout would a germaphobe mage do? Everyone, except for Peel and Aisha, welcomed me. Nice to see you all. I'm in a good mood. It's quite a sight to see the students who used to look at me with subtle eyes now greeting me enthusiastically. People really should make an effort. After stretching my body, I headed towards the center, where the lower body training equipment was located. Oh, you're here. I mean, you came, Theo. Aisha greeted me with a slightly annoyed tone. Why is she acting like this all of a sudden? It doesn't suit her. Aisha, is something wrong? No, nothing's wrong? It seems like there's a big issue, but I decided not to pry. All right, got it. She was just fine two days ago. What changed her mind? It's also strange to see someone I've never seen in the gym before. With that thought in mind, I turned my gaze to Andrew. Andrew, who had caught my eye, approached me. I heard from Aisha that you skillfully led the two teams. You didn't hear that from me, Andrew. Aisha immediately corrected him. After Andrew managed his expression, he spoke again. We had a deep conversation with our club regulars about the magic dungeon incident. Aisha was quite surprised. I guess there was things I didn't know about, there wasn't anything like that. And I wasn't that surprised. Ishild praised you a lot. That's true. Andrew hesitated and closed his mouth. Ah, they say a boy in love becomes a fool. What a pure heart. He's a germaphobe, so he can't even touch exercise equipment others have used. Ah, uh, ah, uh, I, I can do, I can do it. My prediction was accurate. Andrew was still hesitating, debating whether or not to grab the barbell. He kept glancing at Aisha. Is he trying to show off his masculinity? He should just stick to his magic. It's hard to watch. I'll just help him. During the magic dungeon incident, Nocter, who had been on the same team as Andrew, told me how he went above himself to protect everyone. Andrew. Are you going to mock me? Take this. I pulled a handkerchief from my pocket and threw it to Andrew. Of course, it was an excessively fashioned item for a simple handkerchief, tailored to Theo's taste. Andrew looked at me with a puzzled expression, and I immediately provided an answer. It's unused. Wrap it around your hand and use it. You don't have to return it. All right. Andrew turned his head, muttered, I lost again, and tightly wrapped the handkerchief around his hand. Why is he like this? Anyway, I should focus on my own training. Chapter ends. CH44, Mystery, 1. Two days later, on Sunday. In the dormitory of the hero department, a grand and spacious place reserved for only the top 10 students in the grade rankings. Inside Aisha's room, the same group that had gathered for the practical assessment afterparty, Nick, Peel, Jangwei, Aisha, Andrew, and Ishild, had assembled. Under Aisha's leadership, they often held meetings like this. They had met two days ago, and they had met again yesterday. Usually, these gatherings were filled with lightheartedness, with silly jokes and discussions about their daily lives. But today, the atmosphere was serious and tense. They still haven't caught the person responsible for the dungeon incident. They couldn't even identify a suspect, so I assume it's still the same, Nick said, his face serious. The topic at hand was no laughing matter. Everyone listened intently to Nick's words, their expressions grave. Nick continued speaking. They suspected might be a student. Professor Rock asked me to investigate the freshman on behalf of the class. He approached me on Thursday, but I decided to inform you all only now. Well, I would have done the same. Anyone could be a suspect, Peel nodded. After a brief moment of contemplation, Aisha spoke up. Most likely, everyone would have done the same as Neek. 
But, the reason you revealed this information is that you believe in this group and want our help with the investigation, right? Exactly, Aisha. I apologize for not mentioning it earlier. I lack the confidence, Neek bowed his head to the others and expressed his apology. However, no one blamed Neek. They would have acted the same way if they were in his position. Andrew adjusted his glasses and asked, Do you have any potential suspects in mind? Yes, among the freshmen, there are five individuals who have come under suspicion. I've received some information from the instructors and professors, and I've conducted a bit of personal investigation as well. Give me a moment. Neek retrieved a small but thick notebook from his pocket. It was filled with the names and information of the first-year students, along with their alibis. Russell. The members carefully turned the pages of the notebook, reading attentively. Click. All attention was fixed on the notebook. The sound of swallowing saliva and the flipping of pages resonated throughout the room. Finally, when they reached the last page of the notebook, the most likely suspect is, him. Peel's voice shattered the silence. Without explicitly stating the name, everyone knew exactly whom Peel was referring to as him. Lately, he had caused a commotion not only in the hero department but throughout Elinia Academy. A student who had suddenly exhibited remarkable traits, a human who formed strong relationships with orc students, someone who effortlessly defeated high-ranking students in practice duels, and demonstrated exceptional leadership during the Magic Dungeon incident. He was a mysterious figure, shrouded in enigma, with seemingly limitless potential. Theo Lynn Waldirk. Monday morning arrived. Ugh. I yawned and stretched, rousing myself from sleep. It was a fulfilling weekend. On Saturday, I engaged in mock training with magic dolls at the training field reserved for the hero department. Afterward, I sparred and trained physically with Noctur and my other orc classmates. The training field for the hero department was closed on Sundays, so I practiced and received guidance from Irene in the general training field. Having finished my usual preparations for school, I was about to leave and catch the carriage. Please take this, young master, Amy said, handing me a small crystal. The crystal, about the size of a 501 coin, had a grayish hue. A familiar item. A communication crystal. This item, which came in pairs, served as a means of communication in this world. Of course, it couldn't contact just anyone like modern telephones. It could only establish a connection with its paired crystal. Moreover, it has limitations in terms of range and frequency of use. Nevertheless, the ability to enable long-distance communication is a significant advantage in this world. What's this? I feigned ignorance and asked. It's an emergency communication crystal, young master. I thought it would be beneficial for you to carry one, so I prepared it. The instructions are written here, Amy replied, handing me a neatly folded piece of paper. There was no need to read it. I was already familiar with its workings, and the instructions were straightforward. Ah, it's a product sold in the Magic City to the north. I've heard of it. Amy, do you have the other one? Yes, young master, Amy replied, retrieving the communication crystal from her pocket and showing it to me. It was identical to the one she had given me. Hmm, I pondered, looking at Amy. Her expression remained as impassive as ever. It's unsettling. Although it was most likely a low-grade item due to its gray appearance, it was still quite expensive. Where did Amy obtain it? From Equilibrium, perhaps? In any case, I should hold on to it for now. It might prove useful. Briefly, the thought crossed my mind that it could be enchanted with location tracking magic, but I quickly dismissed the idea. They wouldn't go through such trouble just to eliminate me. To put it bluntly, all they needed to do was sneak into my room while I slept and repeatedly stab me. It was a simple task. Understood. Thank you for the item, I acknowledged before heading off to catch the school carriage. Upon arriving at the classroom, I noticed that all the students were present, as expected. According to the main storyline, today should have been a day off. However, a few students were casting me peculiar glances, as if they were observing an unfamiliar creature. Why are they acting like this? Deciding not to dwell on it, I brushed off the thought. While lost in my musings, Noctur, who had been glaring at me as if he could devour a textbook, approached. Hey, Theo. What did you do yesterday? I trained with my fiancé. Ah, the purple-haired human woman we saw, right? Yes. Heh <laughs> heh, you're really hardworking. It's good to put in effort, but don't become too obsessed with training. A true warrior also has the duty to leave behind many descendants. At his words, the orc classmates burst into laughter. Exactly, exactly. If I attended the same academy as my fiancé? Ha ha. It would be over, completely over. I would definitely have at least ten children before graduation. Tarkhan, you innocent creature. Humans are different from orcs. Even if you start now, three is the limit. Really? 
Hmm, now that you mention it, I suddenly miss Jolmarind back home. I promise to stay inside the house with her day and night for three days when I return. I wonder if she's doing well. I hope she hasn't been snatched away by some other guy, what? My face turned red. Shut up, you orcs. Ha <laughs> ha, Theo. You're old-fashioned in strange ways. Anyway, take this. Noctur handed me a rustling envelope. I knew exactly what it was without even touching it. Clearly, it was a traditional orc tribe's elixir. It should be about time for you to run out, right? If you took it in the proper dosage, you should have run out last night. You're correct. Thank you. I placed the envelope in my bag. Thus, I engaged in a conversation with Noctur and my orc classmates. Before I realized it, it was 9.30 in the morning. It was time for first period to start. However, everyone, attention. Instead of Mari, who usually taught the first period introduction to hero studies lecture, senior professor Rock entered the classroom. Dash. His authoritative, booming voice silenced the students. Rock scanned the students slowly before speaking. Today is a day off. The situation called for cheers, but not a single student uttered a word. It wasn't because we weren't happy. We were simply overwhelmed by Rock's presence. But that doesn't mean tomorrow is a day off. Attend school as usual tomorrow. Dash. The students remained silent. Rock furrowed his brow. Respond. Understood. The students responded enthusiastically, and Rock exited the classroom. The room erupted in chatter once again. What's happening? Is it because of last week's incident? Theo, do you have any information? Noctur and the other orcs looked at me with puzzled expressions. Of course, I knew. The culprit behind the magic dungeon incident last week had not yet been apprehended. However, there was no need to disclose that information directly. No. Naturally, I knew who the culprit was. But if I were to reveal or capture the culprit myself, it could further complicate the already twisted storyline, which worried me. Considering the number of incidents I've caused since possessing Theo, I don't expect the story to progress as it originally did. However, it would be advantageous for me if the story followed the original plot as closely as possible. In any case, this is the true beginning. In a broader sense, the Magic Dungeon incident served as a precursor, indicating that the Academy was starting to face danger. Neek would handle it discreetly. Nocturne spoke up. Really? Well, since we're here, we should train before leaving. Theo, do you want to come with me? Sure. As I packed my belongings, Theo. Sienna approached me with a polite smile on her lips. Why are you calling me? Do I need a reason to call you? Hee hee, what are you doing today? Sienna clung to my right arm. I needed to shake her off first. Ignoring the soft sensation on my right arm, I addressed Noctur. Noctur, go ahead to the training ground. I'll join you later. Hee hee, got it. Noctur exited the classroom through the back door, gritting his teeth menacingly. The orc classmates followed suit. Let's head to the training ground, brothers. Oh, and Theo. Question mark. Thumbs up. Noctur gave me a thumbs up before leaving the classroom. The other orc classmates also flashed me thumbs up with sly smiles before following Noctur. Damn those orc bastards. Lately, they had been teasing me relentlessly. With my face turning red, I tried to come up with a plan to get rid of Sienna. Theo, can I talk to you for a moment? Neek approached me. Chapter ends. CH 45, Mystery, 2. Hmm, what's up, Neek? I asked, glancing at Sienna, who still clung to my right arm. Despite the curious gazes of the surrounding students, Sienna showed no signs of letting go. But something felt different this time. Neek had initiated the conversation, and it didn't seem like he came to share a joke. Quickly, I gathered my thoughts. It must be related to the investigation of the magic dungeon incident. Neek had been asked by senior Professor Rock to investigate the first-year students. At this point, he must have already received the request the investigation team was probably formed by now. However, it was a futile effort. Neek's team would discreetly investigate the first-year students, but they would find nothing. The culprit wasn't a student but an instructor. Only after the culprit had brought most of his cronies into the academy would they act. It was incredibly frustrating when I played through that episode. I would never have handled it that way. Anyway. I pondered, was Neek inviting me to join the investigation team? I didn't want to intentionally interfere with the story, but I saw no reason not to participate. The other team members would take care of it. I just had to be on board. Just by being part of the investigation team, my reputation score will increase, and I'll earn significant extra points in practical evaluations as I was lost in these thoughts, Neek appeared troubled. 
Um, this is a conversation that needs to be held between the two of us, he said, looking at Sienna, who was still clinging to my right arm. It was clear he wanted her to leave. But this fool, I mean Neek, she's going to hear everything anyway. Sienna's spirit magic was unknown to most and Neek had no affinity for spirits. I gazed at Sienna for a moment. Hee hee, I understand. Building relationships with classmates is important. But, don't take too long, okay? Sienna obediently left the classroom, although she would likely send a spirit to eavesdrop, but for now, Sienna was out of earshot. Turning my attention back to Neek, I inquired, so, what is it that requires just the two of us? Neek looked around the classroom where a few students still lingered. Would you mind if we changed locations, he asked. Understood, I replied. I followed Neek to the exclusive dormitory of the hero department. The hero department's exclusive dormitory was a space that clearly showcased the academy's merit-based approach, granting residence only to the top 10 students regardless of age, status, or race. Let's go in, Neek said, opening the door to a room and stepping inside. I followed suit. The room was filled with familiar faces, Peel, Jangwati, Aisha, Andrew, Ishild. Alongside Neek and me, a total of seven people were present. Andrew wasn't part of the group in the original story. It seemed that the future had been altered. But that worked in our favor. Andrew, the top magician among the first-year students, was incredibly talented. He might prove to be a valuable asset to the investigation rather than an obstacle. Let's see how things unfold before making any decisions. Poor Andrew, always appearing wherever Aisha went. Unrequited teenage love can be quite bitter. Nice to see you all, I greeted, to which Peel responded with a slight hesitation. The other members' gazes fell upon me, their expressions somewhat ambiguous. Have they already figured out my plan to freeload? I wondered. And I could understand why. Among 200 students, it hardly seemed fair for the top 10 to share their achievements with someone ranked 181st like me. Theo, you can sit here, Neek said, placing a chair in front of me. It was a high-quality piece, rivaling the one in my own room. Neek certainly didn't purchase it with his own money. The difference in the dormitories of top-ranked students was apparent, even in terms of furniture. You mentioned it would be a conversation between the two of us, but there are others here, I pointed out, gracefully taking a seat on the offered chair. Neek cleared his throat and began. I apologize, Theo. It's an urgent matter. As you may have noticed, we haven't caught the culprit behind the magic dungeon incident yet. That seems to be the case, I promptly replied. There was no need to feign ignorance, even as a freeloader. After the incident, several professors formed an undercover investigation team. We thoroughly examined all the faculty members as there was no sign of external interference. But so far, we haven't discovered any leads regarding the culprit. Neek wore a sullen expression. Of course, it was only natural not to find any clues. The culprit must have manipulated the circumstantial evidence using a high-level magic artifact, making it challenging to counter, even with adequate preparation. I glanced at Neek, and he seemed to understand my thoughts. Therefore, I believe the culprit must be among the students, he concluded. That's a possibility, I nodded nonchalantly. In the original story, the culprit would be apprehended by the upcoming Friday. Even if I didn't expose the criminal, they would be caught eventually. No one had died in this incident, so keeping quiet wouldn't weigh heavily on my conscience. I shifted my gaze to the members. So, what's the reason you called me here? It was likely a request to join their investigation team, but I wouldn't be the first to mention it. The situation would be more favorable if they took the initiative out of impatience. However, the way the members were looking at me seemed odd. What's with them? Couldn't I take things a bit more easily? Given that I had taken over the body of a third-rate extra, they could at least show me a little consideration. Hey, Peel called out with a stern expression. What? She let out a deep sigh before speaking. I have no evidence, but I'll be frank. Go ahead, I encouraged her. Peel bit her lip tightly. It wasn't you, right? What kind of nonsense was she spouting? I glared at her. I don't quite understand. Say it again. You, aren't the culprit who caused the magic dungeon incident, right? Peel maintained eye contact with me, showing her seriousness. Ha! Freeloading, what nonsense! How did things go so wrong? Hoo hoo. I took a deep breath. Why do you think so? Because you've changed too much in a short time. It's like time flows differently for you alone. Have you made a pact with the archdemon? Only someone who has would exhibit such traits. I've simply obtained a new trait. Archdemon? What utter nonsense. An archdemon's discerning gaze was particularly acute. There were geniuses all over the continent who would sell their souls to make a pact. But that explanation simply isn't enough, Peel stated, her gaze fixed on Theo. 
Her eyes burned with crimson rage. No trait can alter a person's personality so rapidly. The exceptional leadership you displayed in the magic dungeon and your composed demeanor in extreme situations, it's too extraordinary. Peel had observed numerous active heroes, even encountering several who ranked within the top ten. Yet, none could compare to Theo. Despite his lack of strength, he resembled a superhero from a fairy tale. His transformation was extraordinary. However, if Theo had indeed made a pact with a great demon, everything would fall into place. Peel knew all too well how people changed when they entered a contract with a great demon. Merely recalling the horrors from that time was enough to make her feel as if she were losing her mind. You can still turn back now. Tell me the truth, Peel pressed, gnawing at her lips. It was a sight she, always proud and filled with righteous competitive spirit, had never shown before others. But Theo simply stared back at her with vacant eyes, saying nothing. His sorrowful gaze shattered the last remnants of her rationality. Speak up, Peel scream erupted like a wail, causing the other members to gaze at me with apprehension. My boiling mind swiftly cooled down. It's rather considerate of them to confront me directly instead of scheming behind my back, implying that this can still be resolved. Even though they're prospective superhumans, they're still in their mid-teens, just kids. They're emotional and lack experience. Naturally, they couldn't grasp the trouble a high-tier magic artifact can unleash. No signs of external interference had been found. Despite scrutinizing the faculty members, not even the tiniest clue emerged, indicating that the culprit must be a student. It was a simple yet rational deduction. Though I was seething with anger, I understood why they harbored suspicions about me to some extent. After all, there was likely no one as out of place as me in the academy at the moment. Culprits often behaved conspicuously at the scene of the crime to deflect suspicion. I possessed all the knowledge of the truth, while they remained in the dark. I am not the culprit, nor have I made a pact with a great demon, I stated firmly. However, there would be consequences for carelessly suspecting someone. The matter was too grave to be dismissed just because they were young. You still. Peel began. Give me two days, and I will apprehend the true culprit behind the magic dungeon incident, I interjected. What? Peel's voice trembled with agitation. Do you have a loud mouth but deaf ears? If you grant me two days, I will expose the real perpetrator responsible for the magic dungeon incident. What do you? Just remember this. I definitely won't forget today's humiliation, I declared, rising from my seat and exiting the room. Chapter ends. CH 46, Lonely. After leaving the dormitory of the hero department, I wandered aimlessly, my footsteps echoing with each thud. I had vowed to make them pay for humiliating me, but instead of feeling refreshed, regret washed over me. It was lonely. Phew. I had struggled to survive. Graduating with excellent grades from the hero department was a matter of life and death for me. Even now, the odds seemed slim. So, I deliberately kept my distance from others and didn't open my heart to anyone. I thought that would make me just a little lonely, but no one would get hurt. It didn't happen that way. Nick, Peel, Aisha, Jangwei, Andrew, Ishild, and the others, we shared our daily routines and, almost unwittingly, I found myself growing fond of them. It's sad. Yes, what I'm feeling right now is disappointment. Then, I heard a distant voice calling my name. It was Neek. He came running from afar, trying to console me. I sent him away. What a spineless brat. I felt anger welling up. Neek, the protagonist of the original story Karen Xena Chronicles, was constantly manipulated by others due to his lack of backbone. This often caused new players to abandon the game, dubbing him a sweet potato. Undoubtedly, he was a good person, but he lacked a distinct philosophy of his own. Perhaps I should call him a blank canvas, easily influenced by his surroundings, people, nations, and occupations. Until he undergoes a profound realization and awakens two years later, he remains as vulnerable as he is now, a chick that hasn't matured into a chicken. Having said that, I realized how immature I was. Regardless of the false accusations thrown at me, I had behaved like an impulsive teenager. If only I had maintained my composure, I might have come up with better ways to prove my innocence. It wasn't you, right? You can still turn back now. Peel's words came to mind. She must have had some doubts. But she still caught the wrong person. Sigh. I kept sighing, a reflection of the loneliness and isolation I feel, as if I am alone in this world without a single ally. I never realized I had such an emotional side. Approximately three and a half years left until graduation. Since I cannot turn back time, I have resolved to accept my circumstances quietly. But something has shifted within me. It's too long. Just a little over a month since I arrived in this world, and my mindset has already been shaken to this extent. As I walk aimlessly, lost in my thoughts, I spot Sienna sitting on a bench. Theo. She runs towards me, eager to engage in conversation. Is the meeting over? 
Yes, I respond wearily. He he, where shall we go now? Let's go together. I muster the strength to give a half-hearted response, barely registering Sienna's words, and continue my aimless walk. How long have I been walking? Eventually, I find myself standing in front of the training ground. Why did I, come here? Perhaps I hoped that intense movement would clear my mind. Even in the modern world, when stress weighed me down, I found solace in physical activity. Since I was already at the training ground, I decided to push my body to its limits. I need to shake off these emotions quickly. Creek I open the door to the training ground and step inside, with Sienna following close behind. As expected, there's no one here at this time. I make my way to the area designated for weightlifting. There, I witness Nocter and his orc classmates competing against each other, lifting heavy barbells. Hua! 13, 14, 15. Thud! Nocter drops the barbell, heavily laden with weights, to the ground. Then, his gaze meets mine, as I stand at the entrance. Hey, Theo! You're here! Did everything go well? Nocter! Yeah, what is it? Nocter glances briefly at Sienna, who stands by my side. Hmm, it's still ongoing, ha! Huh? Dot. In a way, Nocter is a prime example of a character whose fate has been altered because of me. I wondered what he thought of me. I have something to say, I spoke up. What is it? I swallowed hard. I? I am the one responsible for the magic dungeon incident. His reaction surprised me. Nocter remained unfazed and simply said, Really? All right, tell me whenever you're ready. This is not a joke, I insisted, locking eyes with him. Nocter's gaze remained steady, unaffected. Of course it isn't. Theo, you're not the type to jest. But I don't believe you would commit such an act with malicious intent. Silence hung in the air. You must have your reasons, right? Nocter's response was prompt and unwavering. There was no trace of doubt in his eyes. As if it didn't matter to him. I stood there, dumbfounded. What is it about me that makes him place such unwavering faith in my character? Why do you hold such a high opinion of me? Is it because I helped you with the theoretical problems? Or because I taught you how to counter Andrew's techniques? In response, Nocter shrugged his shoulders. Do I really need a reason? Once I trust someone, I trust them to the end. The orcs nodded in agreement, as if it were an undeniable truth. A lump formed in my throat. Have I ever been trusted unconditionally like this in my life? It's just a joke, Nocter. I'm not a criminal. And I can make jokes too. I turned my head away as I spoke. Hee <laughs> hee, Sienna chuckled softly, watching me. So, Theo, you're planning to catch the culprit behind the magic dungeon incident? Nocter cleared his throat. Yes, that's right. I already know who the culprit is, and it would be wise to capture them swiftly with a large group, I replied. Understood. Brothers, did you all hear that? Get your weapons ready, Nocter commanded, prompting the orcs to act swiftly. They each grabbed a practice weapon from the stand. Those with hand axes, double axes, and spears positioned themselves behind Nocter, prepared for action. It might be dangerous. The culprit is a low-level but active hero. They also possess a high-level magic artifact capable of using various debuff magic, I warned sincerely. Without a hint of doubt, they agreed to help, which surprised me somewhat. Well, we can just do what you taught us last time, right? Nocter tapped his temple. It was the method used to forcibly activate Battle Instinct, Blood Fury, and Blessing of the War God during the practical evaluation match against Andrew. I gave a wry smile. Yes, that's right. Even against the debuff magic of a high-level magic artifact, we should be able to counter it once. But before I explain the plan, I rummaged in my pocket and retrieved the emergency communication crystal. If we can mobilize Amy, we should be able to capture the culprit with just these guys and me. As I gathered my thoughts, the orc's eyes widened. What's this? A gem? Ah, these country bumpkins. No, it's an emergency communication crystal. I'm going to use it to call for reinforcements, I explained, pulling the string attached to the communication crystal. After about 30 seconds, Amy's voice came through the crystal. Did you summon me, young master? The conversation was accompanied by some noise. It was a low-quality product, and the distance was quite far. Yes, Amy. There's something you need to, my words were abruptly interrupted. Whoa! What on earth is this, Theo? Is it one of those contraptions those wizard guys make? Those rascals. I knew they were up to no good, inventing all sorts of stuff. So this is the culture shock they taught us about in class. The world outside the desert is truly perilous. Amazing. Once you're done with it, lend it to me, Theo. I need to contact Jolmarin back in our hometown. 
if there's any troublemaker, I'll deal with them right away. The orcs marveled and cackled endlessly. Young master? Is something going on? Amy asked, sounding puzzled from the other side of the crystal. Well, something is going on, but it's unrelated to the current commotion. Just come to the front of the hero department training ground. Understood, young master. Is there anything else you need? I pondered Amy's question. Anything else I need? Bring a set of clothing that allows for easy movement. You should also change into something comfortable. Understood. I will depart immediately, young master. In case of an emergency, please contact me right away. Understood. I pulled the string once more and ended the communication. Sienna, who had been silently observing, spoke up. He he, Theo. What should I do? You can stay where you are. Am I losing my mind? What have I gotten myself into? Sienna's assistance is unnecessary. With my orc companions and Amy, I can easily carry out the arrest. Amy, with her traits of patience, stealth, and acrobat, is perfectly suited for infiltration. Once she discovers the culprit's whereabouts, a swarm of orcs can swiftly apprehend them. Sienna displayed a polite smile. Are you serious? Yes. So, you're saying you don't need me? Yes. What? Did I mishear you? Sienna narrowed her eyes, her gaze resembling that of a predator. In a hurry, I amended my words. No, no, your help would be appreciated. I thought so. Yes, yes. He he. Sienna clung to my arm. The orcs regarded me with what appeared to be pity, shaking their heads. Damn, this is my life now. It's not that I dislike Sienna, but she can be a handful. Well, it will take some time for Amy to arrive. It would be best to inform them of precautions and such in advance. Sienna and Amy will understand in an instant, but these simple-minded orc friends won't. Listen up for a moment. I'll take this opportunity to explain the plan. Sounds good, isn't this exciting? It reminds me of when I was 10 and went to plunder a neighboring tribe. That's when I first soaked my axe in someone else's blood. So, if you have any questions or doubts, speak up right away. I began the briefing. Chapter ends. CH 47 Young King Young Boss, 1. Screech Amy Watson, I've arrived at the training field of the Hero Department as requested, Young Master. Amy entered through the door of the Hero Department training field. All eyes were fixed on her. Oh, is that human Theo's secretary? She seems lacking in muscle and presence. She doesn't appear to be a warrior yet. That human woman could use some of our traditional elixir. Tarkhan, you muscle-brained oaf. Looks aren't everything. Did you forget what we learned during the lecture already? Shut it, Kazim. I scored higher than you last semester. The orcs burst into laughter like mischievous schoolgirls. With a simple wave of his hand, Theo silenced them. You arrived faster than I expected, Amy. As your secretary, or rather, as your servant, it's only natural, my bowed her head respectfully. Her eyes lingered on the orcs intoxicated with the excitement of a secret mission in Siena, who was clinging to Theo's right arm like a cicada hanging from an oak tree. That spirit attached to the young master must have been sent by that elf. Amy felt the energy of the spirits gathered around Sienna. But how did the young master manage to win over that unpredictable elf princess? Amy looked at Sienna. Still clinging tightly to Theo's side, Sienna resembled a large cat begging for its master's affection. I need to act quickly at the guild. Anyway. She had hurriedly come in response to his summons, but the scene she saw was quite unusual. Humans, elves, and orcs. A peculiar blend of three races was enough to startle anyone. To begin with, it's extremely difficult for different races to get along. Could it be? Did he attract different races to seek revenge on the humans who shunned him? Amy had thought he had changed recently, but she never expected it to be to this extent. Considering how he had the orcs under his control, it appeared his position was also solidified. Amy gazed at Theo, her eyes filled with confusion. Sienna's grip on Theo's arm tightened as he spoke. Sienna, it's time to let go. He he, no way. I'm going to make up for all the time I missed over the weekend. Sienna clung to Theo's arm even tighter. Sensing the peculiar sensation traveling through his arm, Theo turned his head and glanced at Amy. You should be able to scout, at least. Theo's eyes were burning with determination. How much does he know? Calling her here in the first place indicated that he had some understanding of her true identity. I will do my best, young master. After a moment of hesitation, Amy nodded her head. Now that everyone is here, I will explain each of our tasks. Theo stood up from his seat and began explaining their duties. Originally, I had allocated two days for this mission, but we won't need that long. 
If everyone performs their assigned roles properly, we will complete the mission by this afternoon. I looked around after explaining the plan. To summarize, my plan is as follows. 1. Amy will secretly scout the culprit's hideout. 2. The hideout will be raided by five orcs under Tarkhan's leadership. 3. The panicked culprit will attempt to escape through the window. For Hethio, Nocter, and Sienna, who will be waiting below the window, will apprehend the culprit. Most of them nodded, understanding the plan. With this team, we will succeed. Amy and the orcs will unquestioningly follow my orders. The crucial part is step 4. Whether we can apprehend the culprit. He will only be aware of Neek and his team. He wouldn't even imagine that the orcs and I will be there. We also have Nocter and Sienna, who possess considerable power. Even if the opponent is an active hero, we can certainly subdue them. Compared to Neek's team, where every member is a star player, our team may seem rather inadequate. Sienna is the only one who can somewhat compete with them. But a weak team has its own way of winning. A team full of flashy star players with strong egos will fail. The majority must support the star player with selfless play. The reason why the king of fish, the Seabream, stands out is because of the flatfish. I'll take on the role of the captain. Any objections? In this kind of mission, there must be only one leader. Even if someone thinks an order is wrong, it must be carried out efficiently. If we keep having conflicts over opinions, the entire team will fall apart. No. Nocter spoke up. Naturally, the other orcs nodded in agreement. And, of course, Amy and Sienna had no objections either. Then, as the captain of this team, I say this, during the mission, follow my orders without question. I will lead you to accomplish a mission that not even the professors and top-tier students could achieve. I made deliberate eye contact with each team member as I spoke. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. We will be the flowers that bloom from the mud. With a stump, the orcs rose from their seats. Then, they raised their weapons high. We follow you, Captain. Amy too felt her spirit ignite. As expected, a tiger wouldn't give birth to a kitten. She had received extensive training in infiltration, stalking, and assassination from Equilibrium when she was young, but this was her first serious mission. It wasn't an assassination job that required extensive preparation, but a reconnaissance mission. Amy clenched her fist, thinking, I'll definitely succeed. Her captain raised his hand. We will head to the staff dormitory immediately, where the culprit is believed to be. Right. The orcs, caught up in the excitement, yelled loudly. Hee hee, my intuition was right. Sienna clung to Theo's right arm once more. Elinia Academy is an isolated place. Aside from weekend Saturday and Sunday and special occasions, there's hardly any reason to venture outside. Being isolated, even if you go out on the weekend, you can only explore the remote areas of the kingdom. The capital of the kingdom and the bustling areas of the empire, far from the academy, can only be visited during holiday breaks. Because of this, most students suffer from unfulfilled desires. One reason the academy encourages extracurricular activities and club involvement is to alleviate students' frustrations. Most academy students are late teenagers, bursting with energy. Unless you're an introverted necromancer, most people enjoy at least one sport. Among male students, the most popular sport is, of course, football. Football. A sport for tough men where weaklings struggle to last the first half. It's a true test of a man's mettle, drenching the dry field with blood and sweat. Pass it. It's my ball. Pass it, damn it. Nah, I'm an egoist. The male students of the hero department are engaged in a game of football on the department's field. Ah. A tackled student lets out a girlish scream. It's understandable, the tackle is actually a powerful low kick, strong enough to wreck a weakling's leg. You bastard. Are you going to keep playing dirty like this? Well, maybe. Stop whining like a bitch. Are you a pussy or something? What? You, you damn bastard. A tense psychological battle ensues. The two men glare at each other, ready to kill. The field is on the brink of an all-out brawl. However, the standoff between the two men quickly dissipated. All due to the appearance of a group on the road above. Wow, orcs. It's absolutely terrifying to see them all gathered like that. Hey, you idiot. Look away. Don't make eye contact. The manly football match resumes only after the strange group disappeared from sight. There's still quite a bit of time until lunch. The timing is good. I might be able to finish up before lunch. As I made my way to the faculty dormitory, where are all of you headed? A professor suddenly appeared in front of us. We're on official business. I responded immediately. Well, it is official business, right? I openly declared to Neek and the others that I would catch the culprit within two days, and nobody stopped me, did they? Is that so? What kind of business? 
The professor narrowed his eyes. Damn, I don't have time for this. This is annoying. I stared back at the professor impassively. As expected from his strict demeanor, he didn't seem to plan on letting us pass without an explanation. If I told him we were going to catch the culprit behind the magic dungeon incident, he might try to stop us. Captain, what should we do? Tarkhan, who had come to my side, asked with a serious expression. Following him, the orcs lined up behind me. The professor narrowed his eyes. Damn, I don't have time for this and it's getting annoying. I looked at the professor calmly. As expected of his strict appearance, he didn't seem to be planning on letting it go easily. If I say we're going to catch the culprit behind the magic dungeon situation, he seems like he'd try to stop us. Captain, what should we do? Tarkhan, who had been by my side before I knew it, spoke with a serious look in his eyes. Following him, the orcs lined up behind me. Ah, this is embarrassing. They're really into this. Following that, young master, please give us your orders. Amy bowed her head respectfully. Why is she doing this again? Chapter ends. CH 48, Young King Young Boss, 2. I looked at the strict professor with a serious expression. I apologize for not being able to disclose details, as it's a top secret mission. However, I can assure you it's not something that would tarnish the dignity of a hero department student. Then, I bowed my head deeply. My over-immersed teammates also bowed their heads. I see. If even you, usually so arrogant, have to bow your head like this, it must be crucial. Tell me when you can talk about it next time. Take care of yourself. The strict professor gave a satisfied smile and stepped aside. Yes, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you for your concern. I needed to hurry. Let's get moving again. As expected of our captain. You beat such a stubborn professor with just a few words. Hee <laughs> hee, Theo. That was so cool. And so, our team arrived at the faculty dormitory. In one of the rooms on the fifth floor of the faculty dormitory, where professors and instructors lived, a man who appeared to be in his early thirties was fiddling with a fist-sized red crystal. The man was none other than Francis, the culprit behind the magic dungeon incident. Francis was an instructor at Elinia Academy, the continent's top educational institution, but his role was limited to assisting with practical evaluations rather than giving lectures. Although he held a respectable position, he was discontent. Hee <laughs> hee, I can't believe they assigned me such a sweet task. Francis was a hero by profession, but he lacked any sense of duty or justice. His actions were driven purely by self-interest. That's why he joined Turning White, a villainous group that claims to restore the corrupted continent back to a blank state. Once I complete this mission successfully, this artifact will be entirely mine. To be honest, Francis had no interest in their cause. That didn't matter to him. All that mattered was the reward. Joining the organization was indeed a wise choice. They gave me such a powerful artifact for a mission of this difficulty. I wonder what I'll get if I succeed in a more challenging mission. Francis gently caressed the fist-sized crystal. While its texture didn't feel any different from a regular crystal, it was no ordinary object. This high-tier magic artifact called Amplification Orb, as the name suggests, amplifies the power when using magic with it. From what he could tell, it seemed to more than double the potency of his magic. With this power, I can do anything. Francis was a low-ranking hero, placed within the bottom 10% of active heroes. In a way, he was a failed hero. But with the Amplification Orb, even mid-ranking heroes would be no match for him. The artifact's effectiveness had already been proven. A week ago, an investigation team visited the academy, but nothing happened. Francis had cast forgetfulness and confusion magic on them, affecting not just one person but the entire team. Of course, even with the help of the Amplification Orb, he had used up all his mana. Even after several days, only about half of his mana had recovered. It doesn't matter. All I have to do is wait. His mana would fully recover by tomorrow. That's when the real operation would begin. Starting tomorrow, Francis planned to secretly bring his comrades from turning white into the academy. Since the academy's own defense has noticeably strengthened since the magic dungeon incident, he can't bring in many people at once, by Friday, all my comrades will have arrived. By then, his job would be nearly complete. His comrades would take care of the rest once they were inside the academy. He didn't know their objective and didn't care. All he needed was his reward. The hero department might be in great danger. What does that have to do with me? Whether students die or the academy is destroyed, what does it matter? Rather, they should thank me. A hero should overcome any challenge, right? With those thoughts in mind, Francis continued to stroke the crystal. Whom? He felt as if someone was watching him. Francis gripped the hand axe he had set next to his bed and opened the window. What is it? But there was nothing there. Must be my imagination. 
Francis scratched the back of his head. As he was on an undercover mission, he was feeling quite on edge. I should get some sleep. As Francis put down the hand axe and lay down on his bed. Bang bang. A loud noise came from beyond the door. Sounds from the hallway. Judging by the footsteps, there are five of them. They're getting closer. Although he was a low-ranking hero, Francis was still a professional. His hand swiftly grabbed the hand axe once more. At that moment, crash. It's time to pay the price, you bastard. The door that had been locked was shattered, and five orcs appeared. Instead of panicking, Francis immediately charged at Tarkhan who was in the front. What price? You stupid green pig. The narrow doorway prevented more than two orcs from entering at once. Francis swung his axe. Arg, ack. The axe lodged into Tarkhan's trapezius. However, there wasn't much blood. Wasn't that a critical hit? Francis's eyes widened slightly. Tarkhan had reacted to the axe aimed at his head. Arg, arg. Tarkhan flexed his trapezius where the axe was lodged. Thud. The axe was immediately dislodged from the trapezius. Only primitive orcs with nothing but muscles can do that. Francis sent a look of admiration at Tarkhan. These orc bastards must be a diversion. The entire area is likely filled with enemies. So, what should I do? Instead of retrieving the embedded axe, Francis quickly dashed towards the window. If I go into the hallway, I'll likely be trapped above and below. There might be enemies outside the window too, but it's better than the hallway. Francis threw himself out the window. Crash. He had no weapon, but it didn't matter. The goal was not to kill the enemy, but to safely escape. Francis was confident in his running. Plus, he still had half his mana and could use magic. If any enemy stuck to him, he could cast a simple debuff spell to shake them off. As he fell from the fifth floor to the first floor. Only three of them? Francis spotted the enemies. Three people were near where he was about to land. Students from the hero department. All three had familiar faces. There's only one reason they would be here at this time. They were enemies. They're really underestimating me. Not even Neek or Peel, just these weaklings. As Francis chuckled in midair, preparing to land, Theo spoke. Let's go, Nocter. All right, let's move. Theo and Nocter, weapons in hand, charged straight at Francis. How annoying. Francis immediately cast debuff spells on the two of them. He only used a little mana, but thanks to the amplification orb, the power was considerable. However. What? Francis witnessed a bizarre scene. Thwack! Nocter had punched himself in the side of the head. Theo, on the other hand, appeared unaffected by the spell. But Francis's bewilderment quickly disappeared. Unlike that blockhead orc and that human leech, he is an active hero. He doesn't panic in urgent situations. Instead of fighting them, Francis ran in the opposite direction. Of course, he could have dealt with those two brats in just 30 seconds, but the orcs that had rushed to the upper floor would soon be here. As expected, he's planning to run. Theo closely observed Francis's legs. I didn't expect him to be this composed, but it doesn't matter. Observer's eye foresaw Francis's movements. His leg muscles swelled as if he were about to run. Catch him, Sienna. Yes. Dot. Sienna, who was at the main gate of the staff dormitory, quickly appeared. I caught him. Did I do well? Coo, ugh. Francis felt something invisible wrapping around his body. It was clear that the elf girl had done something. Immediately, Francis cast a debuff spell on Sienna. Kaya? Sienna let out a cute sound. Slowly, the energy that had been binding Francis disappeared. However, he wasn't in perfect condition. Theo and Nocter, who had quickly rushed over, started stabbing and clubbing at his body. Though the practice weapons weren't sharp, they were enough to break bones. Coo, ugh. Francis is quick at assessing situations. That's why he was certain. He was screwed. Thud, thud his body wouldn't move properly, especially his legs, which refused to respond. To use magic nullification, Theo placed a hand on Sienna's shoulder. Who, hewing? I'm scared. Don't leave me. Theo. Theo embraced the staggering and dizzy Sienna, then looked down at Francis. Francis, suspect in the magic dungeon incident, I'm arresting you. Even if there are suspicions, does a mere student have the right to arrest an instructor? Besides, I've already been investigated by the investigation team. Francis spoke confidently. You'll find out when you wake up. Thud. Tarkhan, who had sprinted over, struck Francis on the head. Following that, the orcs began roughly beating Francis with their muscular arms and legs. Damn, beat the crap out of this guy. 
Hey, don't hit his face. It'll leave a mark, it could cause problems later. Gore, gore. That was Francis's last memory. Chapter ends. CH 49 Young King Young Boss, 3. I think he fainted. Isn't this enough? Tarkhan, you sloppy orc. Why are you so afraid with only this much blood? He's an active hero, isn't he? He won't mind being stepped on this much. Hey, you, lend me your club. The orcs continue beating him even after he had fainted. This should be enough. Afterward, the orcs tightly wrapped the broken Francis with thick ropes. His entire body's bones were probably shattered. It wouldn't matter much even if they didn't tie him, but it's better to make sure. Francis might still have some mana left. Thinking that, I decided to seek out the senior professor, Rock. Rock would likely have a mana ceiling stone. I will be back after visiting the senior professor. Everyone, maintain your positions. Leave it to us, Captain. Yes, young master. It's really nice that they obey without question. I handed the clinging Sienna, who was continuously muttering, over to Amy. Sienna obediently laid on Amy's lap. Hugh Hugh ee. Don't go. It doesn't seem like she's pretending. I thought she would find any reason to cling to me, but she was staying still. Is Sienna really suffering from the aftereffects of debuff magic? I did cast magic nullification. I don't know. This situation never occurred in the original story, so I can't tell. Anyway, let's take care of urgent matters first. Then, I'll be back. Rock's room is on the top floor of the dormitory building. Truly, that bald old man also likes high places like Theo. Judging by his demeanor, he's definitely from a high noble family. I wonder what his story is. I saw Rock's status window last time, but like Neek, his last name didn't appear. With such thoughts, I climbed to the top floor and knocked on Rock's door. Amy found the current situation thrilling. She was filled with a sense of accomplishment from completing her first assignment. They had truly caught a villain who was also an active hero. He seems to be a spy from another group. However, as a low-ranking member of Equilibrium, Amy didn't have access to crucial information. Just like her, Francis could also be a spy from the same faction. Was it right to have helped Theo? During the mission, the situation was so sudden so she had suppressed her doubts. Honestly, something still stirred within her heart. The satisfaction of completing her first real assignment as instructed. And since their top priority was actively assisting Theo, there shouldn't be any problems. She had faithfully carried out orders. Ah, uh, aha. Uh -huh. Please don't leave, please. Amy looked down at the elf princess lying on her lap. Sienna was still moaning in pain. It seems like the aftereffects of the debuff magic are severe. According to Theo, orcs can escape from debuff magic once through self-harm, but elves cannot. Sienna is approximately 150 years old. She must have had a variety of experiences living for a much longer period than humans. The depth of her trauma would be different as well. I should report this to them too. Amy looked down at Sienna with calm eyes and reminded herself of her goal. It's all for my younger sister. No matter what happens now, I have to trust and support Theo. Judging by how Theo acted today, if he gets scouted by the Equilibrium, he would quickly secure a high-ranking position. Power isn't everything. What's more important for a high-ranking official is the ability to control talented subordinates. Today, Theo led the team perfectly. First, I need to carry out the given orders without any mistakes. Then, Theo, once he becomes a high-ranking official, might be able to save Selena, Amy's sister. While thinking about this? Amy felt a sharp presence. Someone was watching her. Her innate senses, surpassing even her stats, was activated. It was a subtle, assassin-like aura, just like hers. Soon, Amy turned her head in the direction of the presence. She saw a silhouette swiftly retreating. It was difficult to identify because the figure was wearing a big hat and coat. Judging by the build, it's a woman, and quite small. Amy's innate senses were excellent. A petite woman who seemed to be about 150 centimeters tall. And that calm aura proved that she was of the same kind as Amy. I need to tell Theo about this right away. Before, she wouldn't have had any expectations of him. But now, she found herself thinking, what if? In the basement detention room of the hero department. I looked at Francis, who was tightly bound and sitting in a chair. His outer appearance looked surprisingly unharmed. But his insides must be completely shattered. A mana seal was placed on Francis's wrist. Although I already secured the high-level magic artifact, amplification orb, debuff magic is dangerous. He has recovered from mana exhaustion. By tomorrow, all his mana should be restored. I don't know when he'll wake up. Francis's pants were wet around the crotch. Well, if he was hit that hard, even the founding principal Ryuk would have wet his pants. 
With my arms crossed, I stared at Francis. This never occurred in the original story, and the physical abilities of a hero are different from ordinary people, so it's even harder to predict. Hmm, he seems likely to wake up in about an hour. Rock, who was standing next to me with a stern expression, had a glint in his eye. How do you know? Well, naturally you learn these things when you've been in the teaching profession for a long time. But we may have gone a bit too far in beating him up. Most healers would be shocked by his condition. At this point in time, there's no one like Archmage Odius, a saint-level healer, the last grand mage of the continent. Even if he is a prime suspect, there was no need to handle him so roughly. Rock looked at me sternly. Well, that's understandable. From a third person's point of view, it looks like a group of big orcs beat up an instructor. We had to, for fear that he might escape. We're just first-year students, and the culprit is a current hero. One of our team members was also attacked. We'll secure evidence within an hour. How did you confirm the culprit? We had skilled and trustworthy personnel conducting thorough investigations, they didn't find him. I got some help from the family. Please don't misunderstand, I only received it for this emergency. Also, we have been investigating separately since the moment the magic dungeon incident occurred. The Waldirk family is a major family known throughout the vast continent. Given Theo's current image, this should be a plausible excuse. If by any chance, they inquire further, it's time be more straightforward. After all, the future has changed significantly compared to the original story. This is my best move right now. Anyway, Amy, who was sent to collect evidence, should be arriving here soon. Francis would have placed a perception disorder spell where he hid the evidence, but it's not a particularly outstanding spell, so it should be found quickly. Even in the original story, the staff investigation teams couldn't find it due to an unexpected, powerful debuff spell. Amy's words come to mind. She said that a small girl had been watching our team and fled. She definitely seemed to be a professional in espionage. It's obvious who it is. Zhang Wahi, if a natural-born assassin like Amy barely noticed her presence, the number of suspects is greatly reduced. And if it's a petite woman of about 150 centimeters, there's no one but Zhang Wahi. Given her character, she wouldn't have trailed us only from the words of students. Is it personal curiosity? Is she interested in me because of magic nullification? If it's Jang Wuhi's sharp intuition, she must have definitely noticed when I used magic nullification on Ralph during the practical evaluation. At that moment. I'm back, young master. Amy, who had returned, bowed to me. You've worked hard. The item? I secured it, young master. It was exactly where you told me. Amy handed me a bundle of letters. I took one out and read it. The letter was encrypted. The others were the same. They also had special characters that made them unreadable. But there is someone who can decode this cipher. Zhang Wahi. She decrypted them in the original story. And considering her righteous character, even as an assassin, she wouldn't lie. Well, even if she lies, I can invite a decryption expert. I asked Rock to send a staff member to bring Zhang Wahi here. She's probably training in her room. After a while, Zhang Wahi arrived at the underground interrogation room. Dot. But Zhang Wahi wasn't the only one who arrived. A total of six people. Neek, Peel, Jang Wahi, Aisha, Andrew, and a child. They all came. Chapter ends.